Greetings and welcome. It's been a few months since my last video, and I must apologize to those of you who've been patiently awaiting a follow-up. In that video, I showed a number of stones which I had collected to send off later that day to a prestigious laboratory in the U.S. for forensic analysis. My hope was to begin to determine once and for all whether or not the stones truly are petrified hearts, as I have asserted in a number of videos on the subject. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, I recommend first watching my videos Petrified Titans and Organs Part 1, The Discoveries, and Part 2, The How and Why, as you'll get far more out of this video if you're already familiar with the research. The two videos total roughly one hour of runtime and offer a brief summary of the research I've been presenting in videos since February of 2019. Those of you already familiar with my research would likely agree that the majority of the mainstream scientific world would consider my conclusions nothing short of batshit crazy. After all, it's no small or easy thing to present research that, if correct, would undermine cornerstones of an entire ology. It's true that I'm the crazy guy who believes that the three-mile-long mountain in my backyard was once a titanic creature and that vast numbers of the stones that we encounter are the petrified remains of creatures big and small that once perished in a great cataclysm. And yes, in just about any room filled with people with crazy ideas, mine would rank highly. A question I'd ask you to ponder is, are these just harebrained ideas, or is there actually empirical, logical evidence in support of my conclusions? This video will begin with a recorded conversation between myself and Harry Hubbard. Harry reached out to me after a friend introduced him to my research. As a lifelong amateur geologist with an extensive collection of stones, he took an immediate interest in my videos and wanting to know more about the stones, contacted Frank Aon, a close friend of his, who's the founder and owner of Orenda Laboratories in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Frank Aon specializes in the investigation, analysis, and authentication of artifacts, antiquities, and geological finds. I'll present more on Frank's qualifications and achievements later in the video. Following my conversation with Harry, I'll play a recorded conversation between Harry and Frank as they discuss his findings regarding the stones, as well as a variety of other related subjects. I'll offer my own comments throughout their conversation and provide visual aids. This video will be somewhat long, but for those of you interested in and familiar with my research and what I have taken to calling biogeology, I believe you'll find it all extremely interesting. For those of you unfamiliar with these subjects, please know that the information that will be presented here today is not particularly difficult, and I'll be providing definitions of terms and visuals throughout the presentation, which will make it easy to follow. So, let's begin. This whole story began when Harry Hubbard contacted me by email on the 27th of May, 2021. Harry wrote, A friend of mine recently called my attention to your channel, and I'm very interested in your discoveries concerning petrified hearts. Is there any way I might be able to purchase a specimen for analysis? Or rather, could I have you send a couple of your fine pieces to a forensic lab in Santa Fe, New Mexico? I'll pay for all shipping charges and for a thorough forensic analysis with documentation. Of course, you would receive a bound report also. I would indeed like to know what mineral these hearts appear to be. Thanks, and I look forward to hearing from you. Harry Hubbard. I replied to him a short time later. Thank you for your very generous offer. I am in Spain, seven hours ahead of you. What is the earliest time you would be available for conversation? After a few more exchanges to arrange a telephone conversation, we spoke on the 31st of May, 2021. Hello. Hi, is this Harry? It sure is. Hi, Harry. This is Mike in Spain. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for calling. Now, I want to record us because I want to have a record, and I can record faster than I can write. And we may have to do some stuff, and you can record also. I mean, that's just for references. Um, now, uh, your email said that you have patients. What kind of patients do you do you counsel? I'm a chiropractor. Oh! <laughs> 
I love it. Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of chiropractors up here that uh, that I do, and, and I actually built an apparatus that I keep in my shop that that I, I, I sit in it. I can throw my arms up on the uh, the turnbuckles and put a towel over the back of my head, lift my feet up, and I get my upper my upper seven vertebrates with it. So, oh, good. it saves me thousands of dollars. I live out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of where whereabouts? I live in. Uh, in southeast Marion County, Illinois. And, uh, okay, I thought uh, the lab is in New Mexico, Santa Fe, right? Yes, it is. It is. My buddy, the, uh, uh, Frank A. on it, the Arenda Lab, is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I met him okay. back in 1999, and I was peddling some pottery for a friend that was from South America. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and I had met several of the uh, people I was I was showing this pottery to. I'd met them at the Tucson Gym Show, and uh, uh, and the guy told me he said you're not going anywhere. Uh, he goes you're new to Santa Fe. Uh, I've never seen anything like this polychrome that you've got, and uh, 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 you you're going to have to go through Frank Aon to get anywhere in this town. And oddly enough, one of the one of the uh, the pots that I had was kind of like a squared off kind of a bottle. And it had uh, two figures, a male and a female, on the top, and and they were, the female was being anally penetrated, and in the action, and I and I and I, when I took it over there, I dropped them off at Frank's lab, and I said, man, this this is just the most bizarre stuff. He goes, oh no, check this out. So what he did was, is he put water in that bottle, and when you tipped it out, it made a noise that goes, just like. I'm like I was stoked. So the the pot was designed to sound like sex when you yes. put the water up. Yes. <laughs> that reminds me of some. Uh, um, there's some different Peruvian whistles. Are you familiar with those? Yeah, I've seen some of those. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have. Mm. And um, yeah, they make. They've got different kinds that make just the most unbelievable sounds. And some friend of these. Of my, a friend of my mom's wrote a book about them a long time ago called Animated Earth. If you're a potter. You would love that book, actually. Uh, they, there were some other pots that, that I had that when you poured out the water, they made a whistling noise, and they made different sounds. It was it was kind of bizarre. But anyway, I had uh, I, I was dealing in artifacts years ago, and uh, uh, um, Frank is a, he's a brilliant artist, um, um, genius metallurgist. Uh, he's an artifact restorer, and he, and he does um, rocks and minerals. I do, too. Um, I've got a YouTube channel. And... Um, uh, it's it's just Harry Hubbard YouTube search and it'll pop up, and I'm I'm all over the place. I collect uh, world currencies, ancient coins, um, minerals, uh, specimens, books. I do a, have a lot of old books, and I live out. I mean, my closest neighbor is over half a mile away. And uh, a friend of mine, who actually is a massage therapist, is a big fan of yours, and she uh, turned me on to a couple of your videos. I'm watching them, and I'm like, whoa, that looks too much like to be true. And I suppose my question, first off, would be, if you're finding hearts, why wouldn't you also find brains and livers? Yeah, well, the, I, I would have expected to find more livers than I do. Um, there, are, there are a number of rocks that I found that, that resemble the shape of livers, but um, I find kidneys, a lot of rocks look like spleens, you know, the, the, there's... Uh, when you look at the, the organs, the, the most distinct of the organs is obviously the heart. And uh, so why I'm not, as far as brains go, I think the brains are destroyed in the, in the cataclysmic process. Because if, I, how many of my videos have you seen? Have you seen? Uh, three or four. Um. Okay. So uh, in the video I did called Petrified Titans and Organs Part 2, the how and why, I present some of my theories. and. The main theory I have is, I, I call it boiled egg theory, because each of the organs is, is surrounded by fascia yeah. and, and is floating in the chest and abdominal cavities. And so the reason I call it boiled egg th- uh, theory is because if you take it, if you think of an egg as having, it's got a calcium shell, uh, and then inside is liquid and you boil it for six minutes and, and you've got a hardened egg. Uh-huh. Well, if you were to add a lot more heat and more time, then you would get something that was a lot harder. And I, I think that that's what's happened and what's creating these organs is, is that there's some cataclysm. I've, I've gone through different theories with regards to volcanism, uh, electricity. There's a lot of uh, theories that are circulating that have to do with different kinds of apocalyptic events, that, you know, whether it's from solar flares or something where major 
major, major electricity grounds out, and uh, that you know could lead to basically some kind of an instant petrification. Because I don't believe that this is happening over long periods of time. I think it's happening rather quickly. And in the process of happening, the outer portions of the body are being destroyed. And so the the chest and abdominal cavities, which are themselves a giant fatty sac, mm-hmm. are filled are filled with fluid. And then the organs are floating in that fluid, also filled, or are, are, are also contained within their own individual fatty sacs. So I think that, that what's happening is as the outer portions of the body are being destroyed, the inner organs are hardening, and then that's what's left. Because I'm not finding the bodies, I'm not finding skeletons. And if you, if you, look, at, um, if you look at bone and how bone reacts to being in a crock pot, you're talking low heat and pressure. So if you add a lot, of, a lot more heat and a lot more pressure, those are just going to disintegrate. Uh, I don't know if you've ever made bone broth, but it cooks down to gel, gel uh, you know, like a gelatinous substance within a pretty short amount of time, really. So yeah, that's that's the overall theory. Uh, as far as uh, livers go, yeah, finding some rocks that, that look like livers, but both livers and lungs have lobes. So things cleave along lobe lines. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, uh, and well, um, my next series, that I, I do series with, with videos, and my next series is, um, is going to be on dinosaurs. All I'm going to be doing is is um, showing my dinosaur books from years ago, decades ago, whatever, and just showing what they say and how they actually contradict themselves from, from, from one book to the next and from one chapter to the next, actually. How they say yeah, one I, thing and then they change their mind or this or that, and that's what uh, why my friend said, "Oh, I got this friend here. I got this guy here in Spain." Da, 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 da. And I said, "Well, that was very interesting." And my my question would always be, if 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 I had a live rabbit and I said, "Okay, here is a million dollars. How do you turn that rabbit into stone? You know, how 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 do, how does any living living creature?" Uh, or, 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 or a carcass just turn, how does it turn to stone either A, before it rots or before it's eaten or, or like, let's face it like um, uh, um, a dinosaur footprint or any kind of footprint if it's fossilized, it had to become fossilized before the next rainstorm otherwise it would have been washed away so it, right. it, it still would have had to have, have had its uh, its character and all of its, its um, um, menial properties in order to uh, maintain its its shape through you know to be to be fossil and like and and I got one, like one book stock process yeah, it's, it's yeah you've got different I mean in mainstream geology they talk about parameteralization they tell us it takes millions of years for it to occur and um, you know I I think when you, when you're looking at petrified trees and the different rare examples of petrified soft tissue that we find. Um, you know, this is where mud fossil theory was initially fascinating to me because the idea of an anaerobic environment where the bacteria and the larvae don't thrive, then then that would preserve the flesh until the parameterization process could occur, which is where the, the minerals that are found in the silt or mud that's surrounding the flesh are working their way into the flesh while the gas and the liquid is working its way out. So that is the, the process of parameterization. So, but in mainstream geology, it's, we're told it takes millions of years. But with mud fossil theory, it, it may happen in, in as little as years. And or, or I would say seconds. I mean, I, I mean, just zap seconds. Uh. Yeah, well, that's, that's more of an instant petrification. And if you look into the work of uh, a guy named Mungo Jutt, he, he's with the Thunderbolts Project. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Yeah, I, I, uh, I kind of locked horns with them over like 10 years ago or so. Um. Yeah, well, you know, each, each little niche community has their opinions and they, you know, their, their pet theories, and a lot of times they, they exclude uh, other theories. I'm more of a selective sister, and I kind of look at the overlaps and look for what works. So, um, but... He's, he's presented a lot of different examples of, uh, in, the, in the fossil record of what he calls instant petrification. Electric so universe, that all, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, then you've got people who, you know, flat earthers talking about the plasma apocalypses, and you've got theories about massive solar flare ejections, and they're, you know, 
for me, I wasn't so hung up on the on the how because I was more focused on what I was finding. The empirical findings, in my opinion, speak for themselves, and then I'll leave it to smarter people to to prove, uh, you know, or to to come up with a, a comprehensive theory and, and and the proof behind it. I have theories, but but I'm not an expert in chemistry or in you know <laughs> physics or anything else. So I, I uh, yeah. I've got more questions than I have answers, basically. You know. Uh, yeah, you, you and me both. Uh, you know, and especially like when it comes to dinosaurs, you look at these massive creatures, and like uh, Triceratops, for instance. His mouth is designed to eat low, uh, low-lying uh, vegetation. Well, how in the world did they did he consume enough calcium in his diet to make that huge ass six-foot head with three-foot horns coming out of it? Where what what was his calcium intake? You're saying he's eating only plants. Uh, well, that, that's uh, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, I think a lot of dinosaurs is is a hoax. Ultimately, I think I think that the dinosaur narrative personally has been used to hide the giant and also to hide the, the truth about uh, probably dragons and you know some kind of serpentine creatures that existed in the past. That's um, that's kind I, of where my series is going because there's so many dinosaurs that they claim well they have a tooth of it. Or they have a toe. Yeah. Or they have a. Yeah, when, when you dig in that dinosaur stuff, it's like it's it's in my opinion, it's clearly a hoax. So there's a lot of it. That. That is. I don't have. I can't regurgitate facts off the top of my head, but there's a lot of funny business in every aspect of dinosaurianism. <laughs> yes, dinosauria, yeah. and 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 that's kind of where I'm going with it because because when when you start making it up as you go, the sky is the limit. Well, I, I've made that up. I've made that up. Well, hold on, I'm at a barrier here. I'll just make up something else. I'll make up yeah. this dinosaur. I'll make up this dinosaur. Make... Yeah, but one one answer to your question, you know, with the, the whole dinosaur hoax thing aside, <laughs> you know, to the Triceratops having you know way too much calcium in his body. Uh, than he could possibly have in his diet. If you look into, um, there's a lot of research out there on the topic of, of biological transmutation and also electrical transmutation. So high forces, you know, we're, we're told that this isn't possible because in the mainstream, uh, you know, physics model, you get your periodic table of elements and all of those elements are born in the heart of stars and they require you know, incredible forces for incredible amounts of time to be created. And that, you know, that's kind of what we're all told if you go through the mainstream education. But when you look into it deeper, you find out that there's actually a ton of different scientific experiments that are proving biological and electrical transfer, transmutation in different ways. In other words, one element is converted into another. And a perfect example of that is the chicken. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. because if you look at the diet of a chicken and you measure all of the different quantities the chicken is, is consuming throughout the day, the egg shell that the chicken produces every single day contains more calcium than the chicken is, is consuming. I so never thought of that. Yeah, taking, but you're right. They're taking other uh, substances that are in their diet and they're literally manufacturing biologically calcium. Mm -hmm. So there are literally tons of examples of this. There's people who've done experiments with plants, you know, because plants are doing photosynthesis, they're absorbing air and they're absor or, uh, CO2 and, and water. And what they've done is, is taken a plant and put it in the pot and measured all of the constituent parts that are in the pot before, and they've weighed everything. And then over the course of time, this plant grows and it takes on mass and it's producing elements that are not in its diet. Mm -hmm. so there, right there you have a proof that, that the plant is capable of synthesizing elements, which is, that's contrary to the mainstream mm. narrative when it comes to physics. Well, these hearts that you're, that you're finding, what, what are uh, 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 the size range from them as far as poundage goes, how, uh, as far as what, how much they weigh now? How, how, what, what, are, what are some of the lighter ones? What, what, what do some of the lighter ones weigh? Well, I mean, I've got them from millimeters up to the biggest in my office is uh, is a foot and a half, and that's only that's only the biggest because that's uh, what I could get back to my office. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you if you go into the video that I did called um, "Petrified Organs, Giants, Hearts, 
and uh, how to spot them, I, I lay out the, the collection there. Actually, more recently, there's, there's a video that I did um, called uh, More Heartstone Synchronicities, and that, that had to do with uh, a, a, a man who was paying me a visit, and I, I laid them all out and arranged them by category, and that's the best display that I've done. And there you can see that they go from from tiny all the way up to the biggest okay. one in my office is uh, a foot and a half. Okay, I, I don't but, guess but I've, I've seen. I've seen them in the field, multiple feet. Okay, are are they agate? Uh, no, they're not. They're not agate. I'm not sure exactly how they would look if I were to slice them and and they were to be polished, because I've never done it. The, mm -hmm. the closest I've gotten to doing that was in a video that I did called uh, Broken Hearts Tell Tales. And that video uh, is, uh, I, I basically went into the field and I, and I live, I found a bunch of uh, the, heart, the heart stones that, that matched all of these characteristics that I was already doing videos about. Mm -hmm. And uh, went out there and found a number of them that, uh, that matched that and then I broke them open in the field and you could see the inner chambers, and some of them look like. Yeah, I saw uh, that. I, 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 yeah, I saw that. So uh, um, we want to know how, if we could get one or two specimens, do would you want to be paid for them? Would you want them? Uh, would you want them uh, returned to you? How can we get maybe a couple of these that are small, maybe the size of a fist, uh, um, in into the lab? And and uh, uh, and set up some way that we could pay you for your time and effort, and and uh, and also provide you with a uh, with a uh, uh, documentation of right. of, of well, that's, what. That's what I'm most interested in, and I wouldn't I wouldn't charge um, you for the stones. Um, the the thing is, I have three specimens. I I have literally hundreds here, okay. um, but there's three in particular that I won't part with, and that's because. I'm, I'm waiting to get CAT scans on them. I've been looking for a lab that will allow me to do it. Um, the labs that I've contacted here in Spain have rejected it because they'll only do human specimens. And uh, so I've started contacting veterinarians, and I found a vet that has a CAT scan uh, equipment, so I might, I might be able to get them done. But the reason I want to do that is because it will, it will help me to visualize in 3D internal structures because because the CAT scan shows you, it's like an X-ray, but it's, it, 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 it does an arc, and it, and, it, and it takes like 30 different X-rays, you know, right. really quickly. And then the computer uh, does a composite of those, so you get a 3D rendering of this, this structure. Uh -huh. So that's, that's what I want to do, and I'm definitely going to do that before any of these stones are... Um, are um, damaged in any way. I don't want to cut them open. I, you know, I want to get them in their original state. Uh -huh. um, but as far as like, if you're talking fist size, I could easily um, find some really good specimens. I, mean, I already have some, but certain ones I don't want to part with. Uh -huh. um, These don't and, have to be uh, perfect or nothing. I mean, I mean, uh, we're yeah, just just ones that I'm very confident are you know fit this category that I've been uh, teaching people about. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're willing to pay for the shipping yeah. and, and the lab work, and I can get the, you know, a copy of the lab work afterwards, then uh, you know, that's, that's good enough for me. I don't need any compensation for it. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you can just, <clears throat> you can, you know, I don't know, pay by PayPal or something like that, you know, for the shipping cost. Okay. Um, and, and just one, one, one thing to keep in mind, because uh, originally I thought, I, I mean, what kind of what kind of testing are you are you considering getting? What, what do you think? Uh, it would you would have um, available uh, mineral composite, uh, um, any crystallization, any uh, uh, microscopic uh, details, uh, hardness. Uh, when you say mineral composition, are you referring to spectroscopy, like an XRF machine? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, he's got everything. Okay, he's got everything. So um, if he's got an XRF machine, that's what I've really most been wanting to do with these. Okay. Um, and and you know, I guess you have to pulverize, you, you slice open and get the the internal material, and then you probably have to pulverize that in order to get an XRF uh, analysis done. Because I think you have to start with with, you know, like, sand kind of, you know, substance. Because I, 
understand is they hit it with some kind of radiation and then it reflects back and that tells them what what the different uh, constituent elements are and what percentages are there. Okay. Which is which is the most interesting of all because then you can compare that to well what do we know about the, the you know, the heart and what it's composite it's com- composite elements are. Okay. In a heart, you know, in a in a fleshy heart. The problem with that, and I didn't realize this until some months ago, because I thought that would be the you know the, the final nail in the coffin on top of all of the, the anatomical correlations, um, is that whatever causes the petrification could very well be causing a transmutation of elements as well. So it might not be as simple as just getting an XRF and going, oh look, it's got the same anatomic or uh, atomic structure as the heart. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'll find a Vimeo where he's given a speech and send it to you. Uh-huh. And he, he he's very thorough. He he does um speeches and such. He got cut short, but he covers a lot of area. I mean, it, the the presentation could have been an hour longer, and I would have just been enthralled. Yeah, that's the the guy with the lab. Yes. There's three or four. What, what, three, it? three or four is fine. The size of a fist would be fine. I'll do three or four the size of a fist, and then I'll throw in um, some small ones that I that I okay. candidates as well. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll do that. Um, what, what day is this? It's Monday. I should be able. I've got a pretty busy couple days here. I should be able to, to get him out by Thursday. Okay, no biggie. Wait. And um, once I find out. Okay, and just just let me know, and I'll fire you some out and, and some for you extra for your time too. What kind of what kind of turnaround time do you think your friend needs in order to be able to do it? Well, he's excited. Um, I spoke to him this morning because he was excited that I was going to touch base with you. And so, uh-huh. so uh, uh, I'm sure he's going to be he's going to be excited, and uh, uh, I would say probably within a couple of weeks. It takes him longer to do the paperwork than it does for the the critical exam. And um, right. so that's that's what the deal is. And then and then once he once we get that, I'll either email you the documents or send them to you hard hard copy in the mail or something. Okay. okay well, I'll I'll be touching base with him again uh, later th- today, and let him know that that, that we got the ball moving. And uh, uh, yeah, he 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 was excited. It, it's 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 not it, it's unusual to hear Frank get excited about anything. You know, so. But when he does, he does, you know, so. And has he seen any of my videos or? or yeah, yeah, yeah. I sent him the link. He, he checked out a couple of them. He goes, yeah, that's some interesting st- stuff there, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, um, cool. and, and, and there's and there's nothing else like it, you know. I mean, there's no, nobody else has got, a, uh, got, and that's really what I like. I like people that are doing original material that nobody else on YouTube is doing. And that's what I try to do with my videos. And uh, especially like uh, with this oh, series on dinosaurs, I'm doing. Prolific. I'm looking at your channel now. You got about a hundred videos. It looks like. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I'll check some of those out. Have you seen the stuff that I've done on the mountain? Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm working. I'm working on part six right now. I'm hoping to be done in the next couple of days. And my my main thing is actually you know more geared towards ancient languages, uh, uh, Roman. Egyptian, um, Persian history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I have a lot of side tangents. We found an ancient tomb over here in Illinois that's about four and a half miles away from where I'm at that was in all these treasure books for decades, and nobody knew what it was. And then this guy started pulling out artifacts that had script on them, and come to find out, it's a it's a hodgepodge of uh, archaic Latin, Punic, with some Greek characters. And you'll have uh, uh, there's a lot of Egyptian hieroglyph. I did a, an, an Egyptian series. Just on the Egyptian, or I show over 200 Egyptian artifacts that came from right out of here, close to my backyard. You know, so, and um, and 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 uh, that's how I met Frank Aon. Also, as he started authenticating and looking, examining the artifacts that I had from here, and he was like stoked. All right. Hey, I've enjoyed speaking with you, sir.
Likewise, and uh, I'll, I'll be in touch when I when I've got uh, my stuff together to get these rocks out. But now, uh, hearing that you're a chiropractor, that make that now it makes sense of why you know so much about anatomy and hearts. <laughs> that, that makes that makes sense. I was wondering, like, yeah, that's, how that the hell does he know so much about? It? <laughs> yeah, that was why I was able to initially, you know, recognize the the features in the rock that I found as well. Um, yeah. Had, had, I got another question. Had anybody else ever suspected this at all? Well, you know, the mud fossil thing, uh, I don't know if you've dug into that at all with Roger Spur and his channel, Mud Fossil University. Uh, I have. I have seen some several of his videos, yeah. Yeah. He, he, I never saw him present anything about any heart. And, uh, and then there's another guy named uh, Alan who, with a channel called Flat Earth Nation. And he's done a lot of what he calls nephorensics, where he's analyzing different stones. And he makes a lot of claims about, you know, what the anatomical features in the stones are. And sometimes it, like, made sense. And other times I was just like, okay, really? <laughs> you know, I couldn't, couldn't really see what he was seeing. And so I was frustrated by the, the lack of clarity and, and how many claims were being made that, that you know, this is, this is a this, 100%. You know, and, and uh, so I just kind of put it out there to the universe that I would love to find something that was just undeniable, that was that, that was proof, you know, of, of the existence of mud fossils. Uh -huh. A few days later, I was walking a river bottom, and I found that first rock that I did the video on called Mud Fossils, The Heart of the Matter. And that kind of unlocked the whole subject for me, because once I found that one, uh, I realized that, well, if this is true, then it should be reproducible. I should be able to go back out and find a number of others. And the more I looked, the more I started to recognize these characteristic features that they, that they, you know, many of them were having. And it went beyond, well beyond cherry picking and, and uh, you know, into the realm of, of an actual phenomenon that, uh, that was repeatable and many people around the world have gone out and found them and sent me pictures. So, um, it's, you know, this this can't be easily explained by erosion. They're not chunks of larger structures that have broken off and rolled around and eroded. These are continuous pieces that are unbroken. As soon as there's any kind of a fracture to them, it's easily recognizable. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so that was just kind of how it began. And since then, I've, I've, you know, refined the ability to spot these so I can go out anywhere and in, in the space of a few seconds I can, I can find them, you know, whether it's a river bottom or a valley or, or uh, I, you know, some even on mountaintops. <laughs> so it's, um, it's going to be fun to see some, some proper scientific analysis done beyond just uh, looking at the, the anatomy and, and, and comparing it. Well, okay. Well, let's see. Have a, a, a wonderful evening. Thanks for calling, and I sure do appreciate it. And we'll get the ball moat rolling on this. My pleasure. Take care. Mine too. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. As promised, Harry sent a link to the lecture given by Frank Aon at the prestigious Explorers Club in New York City. As I watched the video, I was quickly impressed by his scope of knowledge. He's clearly an expert in a variety of fields, and I had no doubt he'd be able to help me determine more about the stones. But rather than just ship them off, I wanted to get a better feel for who he was and to inquire about what sort of testing he intended to do. A couple of days later, I called Arenda Laboratory and was soon speaking with Frank himself. I would have liked to have recorded the conversation, but was concerned he might feel I was a bit suspicious of his intentions and authenticity. I mostly asked questions, letting him do most of the talking to get a better sense of who he was. We spoke for nearly an hour, and in all honesty, I came away from that conversation concluding that Frank was one of the most intelligent and knowledgeable people I've ever spoken to. The majority of our conversation consisted of him sharing different anecdotal stories about rare artifacts that he had worked with and the various tests and instrumentation used in authenticating them. You can get a taste for his stories in his presentation at the Explorers Club. At one point in our conversation, I asked whether he was familiar with the research I had presented or if he had seen any of my videos. He told me he had not, and then he went on to explain that he does his utmost to remain as impartial as possible when approaching the analysis of the samples provided to him, not wishing to inadvertently cloud his judgment with cognitive biases. 
Fair enough. Throughout the conversation, he stressed the need for researchers to remain open-minded and teachable. We should all be willing to accept hard truths and admit when we're wrong. He presented himself as a man who had devoted much of his life to the quest for truth, and I resonated with many of the things he was saying. But I also sensed that his words were being carefully chosen to soften the blow for what would probably be a big letdown when all was said and done. I couldn't help but wonder, though, if I'm actually correct in my conclusions about the stones, would a man with a background such as his even be able to see or accept it? After all, it would mean that the foundations of what he believes about the origin of stone, or petrogenesis, is built on faulty premises. One week following my conversation with Harry, and a couple of days after my conversation with Frank, I gathered together a sampling of stones, pictured here, and sent them to Frank's laboratory in New Mexico for a forensic analysis. I hoped that he would approach the research with the integrity he seemed to champion, and not be blinded by assumptions inherent to the mainstream geological paradigm. On July 17th, I received the following email from Harry. I recorded the preliminary conversation and will be placing it in the cloud as soon as my tech contacts me. They aren't what you thought, but every bit is intriguing to me. We'll be sending you links and pictures as soon as I can transfer them. Paperwork will come later. With permission, you'll be able to download the recording and edit it as you wish, because there's a lot of just back-and-forth bullshit between me and Frank on it. It's 36 minutes long, and about half of it pertains to your specimens. I'll be in touch as long as it takes to provide you with everything you wish to have. I congratulate you on having the testicular fortitude to provide specimens for further research. My hat's off to you. Coming forth soon for you, and I will let you know ASAP. Thank you. Harry Hubbard A short time later, Harry sent me Frank's initial response. Hey Harry, the likeliest candidate for the heart rocks is what I call a carbonate environment conglomerate that was formed when multicolored clay deposits were tumbled in glacial rivers of ice. The internal pebbles of clay are slowing, condensed, and pressed, and the binder rock, which holds the internal clusters of clay rocks, all becomes compressed. These rocks then find their way into sedimentary layers and are pressed into metamorphic rocks. When they're cut open, they can look like many organic objects. I have many images of similar rocks. They are not fossilized hearts. The hearts of Paleolithic mammals and much older dinosaurs are found as fossilized specimens inside the animal fossils, and they look nothing like these rocks sent to me. Nothing. The fossilized hearts look like flattened hearts, which is a key to real fossilized hearts. They tend to be flattened. An obvious condition of fossilized internal organs found, known, and studied extensively. These are very fine specimens in and of themselves and should not be relegated to rubbish heaps. Kind regards, Frank. And then he adds, Harry, the most important missing elements of the rocks sent, besides clear fossilized chambers, were the missing interventricular septum. All fossilized hearts found had this stunning evidence. And another note. Hey Harry, last note. I worked in three hospitals and for two different pathologists for many years as a pathology assistant and histologist doing autopsies and processing tissues for slides. I've cut open many human hearts. Also, I'm a farm boy that helped butcher every farm animal you can think of. I know what hearts look like in the bodies, cut out of them, and sliced open. Wow. So how about that for throwing down the gauntlet? For those of you who've been following my channel, but have remained skeptical of my conclusions, I imagine Frank Aon's letter may be all you require to conclude at this point that this is game over for my petrified organs theory, especially if we factor in Aon's impressive list of qualifications. 
But I'd ask you to please hang around for the remainder of the information I have today to see if your opinion changes by the end of this presentation. I encourage skepticism, and I've said this from the beginning. Don't take my word for these things. Go out and look for yourselves and see what you find. We're constantly urged to trust the science, and that even when something contradicts experience or common sense, that we should rely on authorities to grace us with the truth. I believe this kind of thinking is dangerous for a society. In logic, it's what is known as an appeal to authority fallacy. There's a reason that logic and rhetoric are rarely taught in schools today. The powers that shouldn't be are uninterested in youth who are trained in critical thinking or armed with the ability to spot fallacious reasoning and liars. They'd prefer instead that we just move over, little guy, and let the big boys do the thinking. And if a truly paradigm-challenging idea begins to gain traction, you can be sure the gatekeeping narrative defenders will quickly swoop in with techniques and technology that ensures that the heretical idea never reaches into mainstream consciousness. But if I'm correct in my conclusion that much of what we think of as geology is actually biogeology, I'd have to say that it was actually my training in anatomy and histology, not geology, that helped me to recognize this pattern that a world full of geologists has missed. But I'm sure that the vast majority of geologists aren't in on some grand deception, but are good people who are simply paradigm blind, and like all of us have been specifically trained not to see this pattern. If petrified organs truly are a widespread thing, then it means that the stones are not merely broken chunks of larger structures randomly eroded, but rather are exhibiting specific anatomical features, as well as up, down, front, and back orientations, which are discernible to those who know the anatomy. And if so, then this is an excellent reminder of the need for cross-disciplinary approaches, which provide fertile ground for new discoveries, and assist myopic experts in stepping back occasionally and seeing the bigger picture. Some would say that this is the whole point of the peer review process. Peer review is hailed as the gold standard of research and might seem a good idea, but at its worst it becomes a form of centralized control and a breeding ground for corruption and nepotism. Anyone doubting this should think long and hard about the last two years of our lives and then play the follow the money game I've been open from the beginning about the fact that I have absolutely no formal training in geology. My knowledge of chemistry, physics, paleontology, and archaeology is cursory at best. So some of you may be wondering, who am I to challenge major cornerstones of the entire geological narrative? It's a valid question. For those of you who might be wondering about my qualifications, my five years of chiropractic study concluded with a three-month internship in Swedish hospitals, where I followed alongside medical doctors, several of whom were heads of their respective departments. A third of that time was spent alongside orthopedic surgeons, where I participated in dozens of operations. My master's thesis was on the subject of spinal manipulation technique and its effect on autonomic disease. Does any of this make me an expert in geology? Of course not. In fact, when it comes to the specialist expertise of people like Frank Aon, I'll be the first to admit I'm way out of my league and well out of my realm of expertise. So with that said, let's begin a deep dive into the remainder of the information that I have for you today. And as we do, I'd ask you to consider a variety of different possibilities regarding Aon's conclusions about the stones and, and their implications. Number one. Both Frank Aon and mainstream geology are correct, and I'm wrong about these stones. This would mean that despite being well studied and aware of common scientific pitfalls, I have inadvertently succumbed to them. The most relevant of those being pareidolia, apophenia, cherry picking, and the Dunning-Kruger effect. I've discussed each of these common research mistakes throughout my videos and done my best to avoid them from the beginning. Number two, if I'm correct, then tens of thousands of geologists for a century or more have been mostly wrong about the formation of stone or petrogenesis. 
and have missed one of the most important geological rediscoveries in history. This is old knowledge in my opinion, not new. And if true, it would vindicate indigenous peoples around the world who were too often perceived as primitives for their animistic beliefs. This would actually mean that they have been closer to the truth than modern geologists when it comes to petrogenesis and the Earth's history. It would also mean, as I have felt for some time now, that mythologies and religious texts encode our true history, and what is presented as history today is nothing more than fabrications or flat-out lies. And number three, another very real possibility, is that we have all been intentionally misled. And key players at the highest levels in academic research institutions are creating and maintaining narratives specifically designed to mislead us about the true nature of reality. A few days later, I wrote back to him. Hi, Harry. Thanks for getting back to me. I've downloaded and listened to the conversation. I have a number of questions and thoughts to share, but first would love to see the images that Frank mentions emailing to you. Frank mentioned microscopic observations and that he sent several images, but made no mention of any laboratory analyses. Do you know if he performed any chemical, spectrographic, or other analysis? I would definitely appreciate a report to be able to share with the followers of my channel. Kindest regards, Mike. The next day I received the images, along with a more formal version of the original letter that Frank had sent to Harry. We'll go through Frank's letter in detail, but first let's have a listen to the conversation between Harry and Frank about the results of the testing. Okay, I got the recorder going. What's up? First of all, there are many, many known fossilized parts from paleo mammalian animals, smilodons, mastodons, mammoths, camelids, horses, uh, uh, aurochs, those giant bulls in England, on and on and on. And then countless dinosaur hearts. Just the heart laid out by itself? No, nope, always inside a body. Always inside a body. Okay, that's, that's what concerned me. Okay. And also, you know, um, mummified hearts and frozen hearts of people as well. Um, so they all have things in common. And I sent you images of dinosaur and paleomammalian fossilized hearts in an email. Okay. And then I sent you images of what's called um, glacial conglomerate rock. Sometimes they were originally clay, uh, clay pebbles that were amalgamated into a, a, a cluster. And then uh, there's a binder rock. And the first part of their life, they were tumbled and rolled and compressed together by glacial rivers, frozen rivers. And then they were deposited in what eventually came, became sedimentary rock and then ultimately metamorphic rock. And when they come out, they can have concentric circles in them. They can have uh, uh, very distinct pebbles in them of many different colors. They can have large and slightly smaller pebbles. And so the pebbles inside these conglomerates can look like uh, maybe a chamber that was filled. But what, what they really are, are pebbles that are conglomerated into one rock, but the pebbles maintain various degrees of their um, identity zones or mineralized zones. Now, sometimes those zones, are, as in the case of these rocks, because they were clay pebbles originally, that those zones bleed out and they're not as distinct as some of the images I sent you. Okay. Now, what's, what's missing in these rocks that were sent to me 
are there's no clear chambers in them. There's no, you can, and also there are no attachments for aortas or vessels. And when you see the fossilized examples, you'll see where there were attached vessels. And you can see the chambers distinct. Okay, so now, this is with an endoscopic camera, and we're going into the pulmonary openings, the, the, the openings for the pulmonary arteries. And here you can see the papillary muscles. And before I show you this, I just want to introduce you to another concept, which is this one. Okay, so the, there's a folding of the flesh that, that happens inside, but then you also have what are known as trabecula carnet, carnet being flesh, and trabecula, like trabecular bone, if you saw my other videos. So this is the, the fleshy version of that. So you can imagine that when something like this fossilizes, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be bumpy, right? It's not going to be some smooth surface like you would expect the heart to be. It's going to be different from that. And you'll see that in a moment. So, just in case you're wondering what the color difference is, this has been moistened. So I've I've sprayed inside with water, so you can kind of see it. Even when it just gets wet, it all it almost looks biological. This one's dry, and this is a sinus, which which is actually a passage between the the uh, chambers of the heart, and I had that open somewhere, let's see here. Okay, here you can see it. The, the sinuses are here, here, and here in this picture, and that's what we're seeing here and here. And we're going in the other pulmonary artery opening, and you can really see the, the this this raised area here, which is the papillary muscle, and this, this bumpy trabecular carne, and we're actually looking through the chambers out the other side, which is the, the aortal opening right there. This is going into the coronary, or the, yeah, the coronary artery, which is this spot right here. And it's a little too small for me to get the camera in there, but you'll see a little bit of it. And you can see that it also looks very biological. Okay, now we're going into the to the aorta. You can really see that it's it's a it's a chamber. It's, an, it's not just a a space in the rock. But most importantly, and I sent you an image of the heart. They are all missing what's which is called the intervascular septum, which is the main divide of the hearts. And when you look at the fossilized hearts, you will see this intervascular septum. It's very distinct. And none of these rocks have that. Not a one. Okay, I'd just like to unpack a few of the things Frank has brought up so far. For those of you unfamiliar with these subjects, he's quite simply laid out the mainstream explanation regarding the origin of these river rock cobblestones. Those of you already familiar with my videos are likely aware that I've rejected this hypothesis from the very first video I made on the subject. In that first video, I showed 15 different anatomical correlations to heart anatomy. That list has now grown to over 20. In my opinion, the sheer number of anatomical correlations found in these stones goes way beyond pareidolia, what is being offered by both Frank Aon and mainstream geology as a theoretical explanation of their origin is that these stones are the result of random lumps of clay which have hardened through pressure and heat and later are smoothed by water, chemical erosion, and abrasion. In my second video on the subject, I went out live in the field and found a dozen or more stones exhibiting identical characteristics. Since then, I've refined my ability to spot them and have demonstrated in several videos a consistent, repeatable pattern in the stones that I believe cannot logically be brushed away with a hardened lump of clay story. 
Ask yourself as you watch this video whether the images related to Frank's explanations are a good match for the stones I've presented. Some of the heartstone features are incredibly specific, and to explain them away as a chance occurrence is, in my opinion, due to either cognitive bias or laziness. I could be wrong, but this seems to me to be assumptions based on assumptions. Remember, with the heartstones, I've documented and attempted to make sense of empirical evidence. The stones are already stones, so there's no process to witness or manipulate, so there's no experiment to be performed. What I've begun to offer instead is the beginning of what is known in mathematics and logic as a proof based on logical consistency. Clay lumps or petrified hearts? In other words, the more anatomically specific features a stone exhibits, the less likely it is that those features could have occurred by random chance. Think of it this way. It's easy to roll a six on a six-sided die, right? Now roll ten sixes in a row. What are your odds of success? Would you even know how to calculate them? Now, Imagine finding a rock with multiple specific features matching the anatomy of a heart. The more features we add to our heart stone wish list, the closer to impossible it should become to find such an unlikely stone. Yet I find them regularly, with ease, and even while filming live. Geologists tell us that these stones form over millions of years of time. They theorize lumps of clay hardening in a surrounding layer and then later popping out and then smoothed out by erosion. But geologists cannot actually witness such a thing occurring, nor are they capable of reproducing the conditions required to replicate such a stone. What they have is conjecture. I, on the other hand, have presented a great deal of empirical evidence in support of my hypothesis. You'll see examples throughout this entire video. For the skeptics among you, I challenge anyone out there to start with several lumps of clay and produce stones exhibiting the same features I presented over and over again in my videos. And I'm not talking about shaping clay by hand and then firing it in a kiln. That would be cheating. Oh, and be sure to film the entire process with no cuts. At this point, some of you might be thinking that I've had quite the, the snarky or defensive tone, or that Frank and Harry have appeared to be sincere and genuinely trying to help, but I haven't given you all the information yet, and in a moment I think you'll better understand my tone. They are all missing what's, which is called the intervascular septum, which is the main divide of the hearts, and when you look at the fossilized hearts, you will see this intervascular septum. It's very distinct. And none of these rocks have that. Not a one. So, your deduction is, are they just um, ha happen chance agates? Or charts? They're not an agate. They're a metamorphic conglomerate rock. They're not even agatized? I mean, there's no agate or jasper in them? There's the beginning of Jasper, but not a true Jasper, no. I'll be damned. I'll be damned. So, so what, what would you uh, then uh, uh, liken them to? A feldspar? Uh, I would liken them, liken them to poly, po, calcitic, um polysilicate conglomerate. So that would have a hardness of what? About five and a half? Up to five and a half, but not, yeah, even pushing towards six, but not six. 5.7-ish or so. Yeah, five to 5.7. They're hard, don't get me wrong, they're metamorphic, mm -hmm. but they are not fossilized hearts. They are what's called uh, calcitic polysilicate conglomerate. Mm -hmm. Uh, were you able to get good pictures of them? Or, 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 yeah, I, have good, I have good pictures of all of them, yeah. Okay, well...
I'm, I'm not disappointed or, or uh, appointed in, in, either way. You know, we wanted to see what it was. And These are great mineral specimens. They're, they are glacial mineral specimens. They started their life in what's called the carbonate environment. And the main structure originally was a type of clay, many and several different colors of clay. And they were pebbles of clay that were, were pushed together into a single cobble. And then that cobble was probably much larger originally, tumbled in glacier rivers, which are ice, slow-moving ice rivers. And there's a lot of pressure, especially since those rocks are at the bottom of the glacier rivers. Mm. And then those are deposited into to layers of sand, which become sedimentary, which then over time becomes metamorphic. These are transitional metamorphic. They have not finished the whole process, but they are still pretty hard specimens. Well, um, I don't guess you've ever seen my uh, my video, Religion of Geology, have you? Uh, not yet, but I'm working my way through a whole <laughs> bunch of your videos. Um, my 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 thing is the the religion of geology. Uh, that's that's uh, what I do. Um, that's my take on uh, the ice sheets, so to speak. My my point of view about geology mineralogy is you can have multiple point of views. My point of view is a very simplistic explanation of what is known to have happened to the rocks. In some cases, they don't know what is the mineral composition of the rocks, what, were the, what was the possible mineral composition of the rocks when they were first being formed, what is the various transitional phases they went through, what do they look like, which your imagination... Every person is going to look at a rock and see something else. Occasionally, you can point... Even when you point out a figure to someone, they're not going to see it the way you say it, see it. They'll see their own version of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's geology, mineralogy, geophysics, which is the study of how rocks are formed, and cosmologic, cosmological geophysics, which is a whole new thing that astrophysicists, that's a branch off the astrophysicist branch or tree. And it's all very interesting to me. And then there's the magic of rocks and what rocks are good for, and many of the rocks have names based on folklore medicine. Jade, the word jade comes from the word hade. Hade, it comes from the ancient word for Latin, and the association was that jade was good for the kidneys. Now what's interesting, the Europeans named it that way. <laughs> And the Chinese named it Yu, and their association with jade is that it's good for the kidneys. And they and they weren't they weren't colluding and and communicating about this point of view. These points of view happened in isolation. So the question is, how did two distinct cultures come up with the same medicinal association for a rock? Well, that's how come, to, to me, how come so many people called it the Milky Way? Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, but I mean, what are they doing? Crushing up the jade and eating it? Uh, sometimes crushing it up and using it to make weapons, uh, to add silica to the ceramic that, that steel is. Steel is basically a ceramic. Uh, by the way, uh, there are, the other names for the Milky Way are uh, the Cloud Serpent, that is a Maya name and uh, a, an Aztec name. Uh, another name for it is um, the, uh, the, the Sky Dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of interesting names that I found in the cultures. The Milky Way is a consistent one for a certain uh, Indo-European cultures. Then there's other associations. But anyway, um, I like the rocks. They are classical cobbles, and the cobbles are metamorphic, and they are conglomerate. Uh, eventually, 
they would have more time, more pressure in the ground, and they would have become horn blend or granite. Okay, okay. Okay, so so in essence, what you're saying is they're, 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 they're still intriguing, regardless of the fact that they're not hearts, but they're still intriguing. Right, they're, they have a hardness to them, but they're a transitional metamorphic rock. They're in the beginnings of metamorphic uh, change. Every, there's no, there's not just, this is igneous, this is sedimentary, this is metamorphic. There's transitional phases. Oftentimes, metamorphic, sedimentary, and igneous rock became igneous rock again. And that igneous rock became metamorphic rock. And then it was pulverized and became sedimentary rock. They're interchangeable. And a, 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 a powdered mineral substance can become, over time, many things over a long period of time can be everything over a long period of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If there's any truth to the patterns I've recognized and presented, then these findings stand in stark opposition to what we have been told about the formation of rock. Ultimately, an integration of this information would require extensive revision of the earth sciences, as well as tenured professors willing to champion research which shakes the cornerstones of the very disciplines they represent. It's far more likely that the research I have presented will be brushed aside as coincidence or pareidolia, and if this information begins to reach a wider audience, which it appears to be doing, it'll most likely be met with hard criticism from the academic side. Mainstream geology tells us that there are three primary classes of rock, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Igneous rock is formed when magma and lava cool. Magma, pushing upward, mixes with surrounding materials and creates a wide variety of different kinds of igneous rock. Through volcanic eruptions and collisions of tectonic plates, mountains are formed, which are then subject to fragmentation and erosion. Earthquakes, rain, wind, and chemical interactions all contribute to the breakdown of rock. Creatures, plant life, fungi, micro and macro organisms feed directly or indirectly off of the minerals of which the rocks are composed, participating in the continual process of breakdown. On the ocean floor, under the immense pressure of water, the remains of living creatures are compressed into layers known as sedimentary rock. With greater and greater pressure and heat over great lengths of time, the layers undergo molecular changes becoming what is known as metamorphic rock. Some of these layers are said to be pushed upward by tectonic activity and others downward where they eventually come into contact with magma, melt, and the cycle of petrogenesis continues. These are the basics of what is found in our school textbooks. Geology tells us that the formation of sedimentary and metamorphic rock occurs in timelines that stretch between tens to hundreds of millions of years. So, uh, I don't think the guy should be disappointed, and if he wants to call them a heart conglomerate, he's welcome to do it. He can name them whatever he wants. But without question, they are not fossilized parts of any animal. Okay, have you seen anything else that was similar to what his find is? Yes. Okay, okay. I, there's, I didn't, I didn't uh, scan or download every picture I found in the books or the internet. I did a few because there, there are many, many examples. And I, I probably should have. There was one photograph that showed these conglomerates found in a cluster in a, in a, in a bedrock. And then they were falling out of the bedrock. And uh, they weren't the same color, but the outside configuration was very similar. Because you can find these isolated cobbles okay. in a bedrock, or they have fallen out of a bedrock. And so uh, you can find a jade is not a sedimentary rock. Jade, both nephrite and jade are, are formed as uh, nodules. Now, the nodules can be the size of a school bus, but there, you, you don't find jade that is, is true layers, although its fibrous consistency would seem so, 
They are nodules, and they are formed by heat, pressure, the heat is from the pressure, and uh, it's a moist environment. There is, there's a lot of water in the environment when jade is formed. So um, uh, cobbles can be formed of all sizes. When you split them open, they can look like all kinds of things. And I sent you some really good images of all of it. Uh, the first the paleo mammal and paleo mammal fossilized. They didn't. Let's see if we can preview it. It, it. it looks like they didn't. Looks like that didn't come. Let's see if it came through. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um. Now I could send you thousands of examples. But I'm not being paid for that. Right, right, right. No, you don't. No, this is, this is just. This is all I need. This is all we need. Um, and, and really and truly, this is what I can suggest. I didn't send the best image of the heart, uh, anatomy of the heart, with the names. But I sent the one that pointed out the intervascular septum, which you see in the fossilized hearts. You see in all hearts, and it is one of the most uh, iconic characteristics of a fossilized heart. The other characteristic is because of the pressure on fossils, mammalia, paleomammalia, and uh, dinosaur, the, the hearts tend to be flattened. And these cobbles don't have that flattening inside when you look inside. Okay. Um how can how can uh, we uh, how can you get some sent to me? Oh oh oh! Did you did you try to see if they fluoresce? Is there any is, is there any short wave to them? No. Okay. Um, how can I how can I send you some bucks for some uh, express box? How, how many pounds is there? Oh, there's quite a few pounds. I'll send it to you uh, a three day FedEx um, ground which is very cheap. It's probably going to cost me 30 bucks. Okay. So, and don't, I don't want you to worry about it. Uh, can I pick one or two to keep? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. Take what you want. I just want a couple. Okay. Yeah, it's always good to have. It's always good to share specimens with, with the forensic lab because yeah. you need it for reference. Well, he's not going to he's not going to like the answer, but what I'm giving you is information the critical information is what they are, calcitic polysilicate conglomerates. Okay. They, are, they are not fossilized hearts of any creature. Okay. They are missing chambers, attachments to aortas and vessels, mm -hmm. and they are missing the intervascular septum. And when you look at the few examples I send you, they have all of those have that. Well, um, I, I guess he's based a lot of his um, YouTube career on these being hearts, which some of them do kind of resemble hearts of certain animals. Uh, and uh, uh, but I think it's just as intriguing of what they do, what they what they are, and what they do look like. But and why would you have a whole? My my question was why would you have a whole riverbed full of these hearts when there's no medium? There's no field medium. Sorry, people love. A good story, and they love a good story of people gathering art. And you know, you could tell, you could write a great book of, of the the proto uh, vampiric uh, creatures that tore hearts out of people and then made these huge offerings. But you could have a blast. Okay. Uh, uh, with storytelling, and people love storytelling, and I have nothing against storytelling. I love to tell stories. Uh, I love to embellish stories. I love to make up ridiculous stories and make people laugh. So <laughs> it's an it's an art form that I appreciate. But what I always am concerned about is when the storytellers uh, do not question the stories at all, mm -hmm. even the ones they make up. Okay. Um, now, uh, how, how can I um, um, 
take care of any paperwork and then um, uh, send him a copy or or uh, can you um, um, talk, talk to him first if he wants paperwork then I will prepare paperwork and I have images of, of the rocks and uh, so it's, it's not that big of a deal okay well can you just put them together and then scan them or take pictures and send them to me and, and then we send them to him or well what I'll do is I'll process the images that I have and then once they're processed I'll send you uh, images do you want them on the email that would be that would be just as fine with me. Okay, I'll compress them down to PDF images and send them to you. Okay, That's and then gonna take a process again. Okay? And then and then and then if he, if, they, if they're in any kind of shape where he can print them up, he can do that. We don't have to you know worry about sending hard copy, but unless he w requests it. But um, well, here's here's what I want you to tell him. Uh, what I want to tell you, and you can tell him or not. Okay. Many years ago. Uh, my friend Peter First, who's dead now, he died when he was 53 plus. Yeah. And uh, he was a very famous anthropologist. His expertise was uh, the wee children that he'd lived with off and on for 40 years, and then the Haida and Kwaki Yudal up in the Northwest. And he was a great guy. He had been a correspondent, a sergeant in the World War II. He was a correspondent for the Stars and Stripes. His stories were astounding. So through him, he arranged for this Texas couple, old man and lady in their 80s, to bring a crystal skull to me to assess its age. And they had been telling people that this skull was between uh, was 20,000 years old mm -hmm. at, at least. And there was the story of this Guatemalan shaman and this priest and this sorcerer and and these people were making seventy five dollars a person for people to come in and meditate with this skull in the center of the room. Mm -hmm. So they brought me the skull and Peter first wanted to bite the heads off these people. They show up and they have these two gals dressed in white who basically ceremonially bring the skull into my lab and put it under a microscope. So it was a choreographed charade. Oh my God! It was it was it was it was delightful, embarrassing, and ridiculous. All of that. And uh, <laughs> so I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. And I'm coming high, and they're waiting. And I say, well, this was either made by one of Brantling uh, workers. Uh, they were good carvers of mineral specimens down in Tosco, Mexico back in the 20s and 30s or it comes from a, 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 a small village. The souvenir shop. <laughs> in uber Eiderstadt, Germany where they made these and there was a, a guy from Germany who would bring them to New York and New Jersey and sell them at mineral shops. And it's not any older. At the oldest it's from the 1890s. But I suspect that it's more like from the 18, from the 19, late 20s or 30s, early 30s. And they said yes, and give us the report, and we'll pay you, blah blah blah. The very next week, they were back presenting the skull as they had, <laughs> yeah. making their 75 bucks a pop, and and telling the same bullshit story. And they had my report, and, and I don't even comprehend what they did in their minds with all of that. It, 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 and I think, to be quite honest, uh, they were there was a cynical and mercenary slant to these people that. They probably knew it wasn't that old, but it was such a good snake and oil. Yeah. So why should they change it if they're making that? They were making a lot of money. And those New Agers believe all kinds of shit anyway, whether it's true or not. They had named the skull. They called the skull Max, and it was one of six more or less life-size skulls. This one was actually bigger than life-size, and it wasn't that naturalistically carved, but it was okay. But, um, 
and it wasn't the highest quality uh, quartz crystal, and and it was not cut on the hexagram axis, so that it was in the center of the head. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of things missing from the really good skulls. There's two skulls that are uh, just crazy good, I've, and I've seen a bunch of quartz skulls, and there's various degrees of quality of them, but. Um, what I, I, what I learned from that experience was that one, Peter first held his cool and, and did not say what he wanted to say to these people. He was so upset with them. And he just kind of followed my lead. Much older man than me, but he followed my lead. I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do my job, mm -hmm. tell them my opinion, and they can do whatever the hell they want. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's my attitude. I, I have no expectations of this guy changing his opinion about these things, one iota. Mm -hmm. Consider the massive amount of empirical evidence I've presented in support of my theory. Now I'd like you to ask yourself, what evidence has Aeon presented that should cause me to change my mind? Has he presented anything more than an opinion? After all, there was no actual lab data. All he has done is safely aligned himself with the official geological narrative, so he can't be wrong, right? Even if I'm wrong about the stones being hearts, it would appear that I've identified an as-of-yet unexplained reoccurring pattern in the stones, which should have been an extremely interesting find to both Frank and Harry. If I'm wrong, this whole thing can serve as a cautionary tale about opening one's mind so far that the brains fall out. Or perhaps instead we should see this as a valuable intellectual exercise that we can all learn from. My critics have continually dismissed my findings with a hand wave without addressing any of the empirical findings I've presented. Isn't that interesting? They insult, they mock, they create straw man arguments, and they parrot beliefs about processes that are implausible and cannot be reproduced or witnessed. Most importantly, as is the case with Frank Aon, they have all avoided any attempt to explain my findings with anything more than that's pareidolia or humiliated clay lump theory. Oh, and please don't let Harry Hubbard's country bumpkin demeanor fool you. This guy is brilliant, ridiculously well studied, has an encyclopedic knowledge of history. He's also an expert in numerous ancient languages and much more. And Frank himself described Harry as one of the most intelligent people he's ever known. And that's my attitude. I, I have no expectations of this guy changing his opinion about these things one iota. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if he did. It would be nice if he embraced some of the standard geological information that has been around since 1865 with not a lot of new stuff added to the knowledge that was assessed at that time. And it was profound knowledge. And a lot of that information is still used to this day because it was that good and that relevant and that pertinent. Well, I had I had several problems. For one, uh, there are 100% surface finds, and and that causes major concern with me concerning decay, uh, 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 um, animals feeding on carrion, and and et cetera, et cetera, and and, uh, and and how things can actually turn to stone on the surface. And then, you know, and then the, 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 the amount of them. No field medium. How can these hearts be found outside of the body? I've answered this question many times in my videos, as well as in my conversation with Harry. It's silly to imagine some worldwide ritual in which the hearts were removed from the bodies. This would suggest that they also removed them from incomprehensible numbers of birds and rodents as well. In contrast to the laughable proto-vampire theory, I presented a rather simple and far more plausible explanation as to why organs would be found petrified outside of their respective bodies. I shared my boiled egg theory with Harriet at the beginning of this video, and I go into more detail in the Petrified Titans and Organs Part 1 and 2 videos. As far as Aeon's comment about the lack of aortas or other blood vessels, there are at least 20 or 30 in this video showing the remains of the aorta and vena cava, some with pulmonary artery openings, and a large number with both sulcus lines and the beloved interventricular septum.
Aeon stated several times that none of the specimens I showed him showed any of the telltale features of heart anatomy, beyond a few of them being generally heart-shaped. This is false, as can be seen in my last video where I filmed each of the stones I sent him from all angles. The larger stones are more likely to exhibit chambers, blood vessel openings, a whider outer portion, and fleshy iron-rich areas where the outer white has worn away. Flattened hearts, by contrast, will usually have pinched off indentations or creases, showing a faint record that the blood vessel was once there. There are many examples of both varieties throughout this video. It seems obvious to me that the forces required to petrify hearts would be more than capable of burning off the outer blood vessels. The heart muscle itself is very dense as compared to the floppy and thin fat of the primary blood vessels. The aorta and vena cava, being thin and brittle once hardened, would simply break off due to impacts and erosion. Many have tree-like fractal blood vessel patterns, and only a few have chambers. I suspect this is due to pressure exerted on the body, which would compress the chambers and exterior openings. In my opinion, these blood vessel anomalies in the stones are found far too often in just the right places to be explained away as simple chance occurrences. Add to that a variety of additional anatomical features, then at some point we begin to move beyond pareidolia towards a distinct and recurring pattern in the stones that matches heart anatomy, occurs with amazing frequency, and cannot be easily explained away with rolling on floor lumping theory or, if you will, R-O-F-L, for short. And then, you know, then the, 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 the amount of them, you know, it just, just, it just seemed too, it just seemed too out, far out in left field for me. And that's why I wanted, reached out to him and said, okay, let's, let's put them in forensics and, 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 and get the real scoop on them. And I appreciate it, Frank. I appreciate it. And, uh, and, uh, if, you, if you could somehow... Uh, let me tell you what was done recently in the past 10 years. A, a, a chemist who's, who's received a lot of flack and a lot of vehement, a vehemently cruel uh, treatment from the, the, uh, the dinosaur community um, from all sections of it. What she did was she went to this specific place in Wyoming where the dinosaur fossils have not completed their fossilized process. Mm -hmm. They are not completely fossilized. They're still, you can still put stuff under the, the electron microscope and see cellular structure. Mm -hmm. So she decided, just from an inspired book of imagination and inspiration, she decided to chemically denature the mineral in these particular fossils. And she isolated connective tissue, and when she finished doing what she did, the connective tissue was elastic and stretchable. Okay, I've heard of that before. Now... Fleshy dinosaurs. Now she did it again and again, and she gave the procedure to other labs, and they replicated it hundreds of times, and all these dinosaur guys were going out of their minds. Some go, well, looks like she's got something going on. And the other thing she did, which helped her case, was she, she found dinosaur fossils, and she identified parts of the fossils as these were female dinosaurs and they had the eggs still inside them. They hadn't laid them. Mm -hmm. And she identified the cellular structure of the eggs and proved without question that they were dinosaur eggs still inside a dinosaur. And the dinosaur community could not debunk her. And they tried and they could not and they had to bow to the evidence and this is the same woman, but they will not bow to this soft tissue thing, to this connective tissue mm -hmm. thing that she's done. Mm -hmm. And it's been replicated countless times. So if, if you ran a similar procedure to these heart stones this guy has given us, mm -hmm. you would not find soft tissue or cellular 
cellular structure. Right. Dr. I Wilkerson. I see no indication of heart cellular structure that remained in any of these blocks. Okay, well, I've got this on tape. Do you mind if I uh, if I play it for him and, um, and and Annette? I don't care if you play it for them. I, I had no intention of offending anybody. I, my, my I know, I know. You're, you're straight my up. My intention is simply to give information, Yeah. and uh, I'm not trying to run anyone's careers or how they make money or how they are creatively inspired. The creative process is a beautiful yeah. thing. And, I, and like, again, I love stories. I love them. But the problem with stories is that uh, you should enjoy telling a story and you should enjoy uh, your idea of a story and what you believe is true, but you should also have an open mind and open heart to a bigger and better truth. Well, that's my thing is, is uh, say what you want, but don't preach it as fact. And the other thing is, remain teachable. Uh, my philosophy is there's always someone better and if you're smart, you learn from them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's many people better than me at all the things I love to do. And that's a beautiful thing. A lot of people have a hard time just acknowledging that someone's better. You know? And, and that's, that's, that's part of friendship is honoring people for what they've accomplished, for what potential they've realized. And, and that's something we don't do for each other. I try and do it because... Hell, I, I love the accomplishments of other people. I truly do, and I honor them and respect them. And um, there's so many areas of art and discipline, the art of the discipline, that uh, are beyond any of my experiences or my endeavors. So uh, communication is really important. But I've given you the best of my information from looking at these rocks with the best of my abilities, a lot of microscopy, a lot of different lenses and X powers. Yeah, I know, comparing I know. Comparing them to a lot of other geological minerals that I have and pictures of other things in my books and on the internet. Mm -hmm. I, I know. Pretty cross-board pictures. That's all I can do, Harry. I know, I know, I know. And and, and I knew, I knew. We, we knew going into it. And that's, that's why I... Um, that's why I uh, um, reached out. You know, that's why I wanted to reach out to him. And uh, and uh, 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 I mean, he's he's a very bright guy. I mean, there, there's no no question about that. And uh, and and well, uh, I admire the fact that he was willing to send these rocks and get the information. Uh, what he does with it is up to him. I have no. That's problem. really big. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's really big of him to to want to. Okay, yeah, this guy's reaching out. Maybe he we got can. My respect just for doing that. Yeah. And uh, um, now, if he finds <laughs> a, a fossilized creature or human or extraterrestrial person ripping these things or pulling a heart out of <laughs> some ancient human, you know, I'll go, well, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, I uh, and, and, but. I, I, I trust your word. I've, I've been working with you for what over 20 years now, and and I've sent a lot of people to you that that their 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 stuff looked good to me. I mean, I've sent I've sent one guy there. He paid a fortune for his pieces. I guess of alabaster. They looked good, but hey, man, if they, if they don't check out, they don't check out. He was real disappointed. I saw a very bizarre portion of the mummy. Uh, it was Peruvian. There was a woman, the, pa the face was painted, it was half a face. Uh, the neck was torn, but it looked like the woman was screaming, and in mid-scream, I, I don't know how else to explain it, it looked like a laser had sliced her head from chin all the way back to the octopus. Uh -huh. And the mummy tissue was like mummy tissue. It was basically very desiccated bone and tissue. But the part that was cut looked like polished stone. And it had been heat treated. <laughs> I, uh, Harry, none of us could speak. A lot of people looked at it. The tissue was mineralized. No one could explain it. And it was a perfect 
linear cut. It was perfect. It was sliced by something of tremendous um, precision. Wow. And it was bizarre, and the, it was creepy because it looked like she screamed as they did this, and it was it was it was hard to look at. It was beautiful, it was human, and it was creepy. And there's plenty of examples of creepy of uh, what ancient people did, things that do survive, tools they used to do it, pots they threw burning hearts into. Uh, 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 stone sculptures of priests wearing the skins of teenagers mm -hmm. and on and on and on so the, the creep factor for what humans have done there's plenty of legitimate evidence that points to these stories being not only true but extremely accurate and we have plenty of folklore which you, you have to wonder where the folklore came from. It had to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's always a possibility of other explanations. But these rocks were never hard. And I wish I could say they were. Uh, when I, the, the ones that are broken that I could see inside, they have some semblance of being heart-like. But the chambers, are, you know, the areas aren't right. They're just pebbles inside of, you know, they're conglomerates. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, again, the most critical is no attachments for aortas of vessels and the intervascular septum not there. Okay. The first thing I want to say about all this is that I didn't agree to send these rocks to Arenda Lab for an anatomical analysis. In fact... There's no mention in my conversations with Frank or Harry that anatomy was going to play a key role in his approach to analysis. I would have, of course, been open to that as well, but would have instead chosen entirely different specimens to send had I known that so much of his analysis would be based on anatomy. I've covered the anatomy in great detail in all of my videos, and if he had watched any of them, he would have known the key features I've documented. So in the beginning of Frank's conversation with Harry, he spoke a lot about fossilized hearts. He referred to them always being found within the bodies, uh, also known as uh, the field medium that Harry refers to. And he spoke about them being flattened, and he spoke about them all having the remains of the, the primary blood vessels and the intervascular septum. So I decided to do some image searches to see what comes up. When I search for fossilized heart, we get a lot of these these uh, carved little plate type things sold in gift shops. Um, and it, I didn't have to scroll very far before I ran across the image that Frank sent. And um, so we'll come back to that in a moment. This, uh, at first glance, might appear to be one of the heart stones, but if you can see here, this has got a symmetry to it that uh, is not found in any of the stones that I've been showing. This is what is known as a bivalve fossil. It comes from a shell. You can see it. You can see it here, looking at the end, and you get this symmetry between the two sides. So this is not a heart. None of the heart stones that I have uh, been showing uh, look like this. So coming back to this image search, not really much to find at all in the way of fossilized hearts. This is actually the backside of the heart image that Frank sent, another bivalve. So basically no examples of fossilized hearts except for the one that Frank sent. This one, which could also be a bivalve, we can't see both sides, so there may be a, a symmetry there on the other side. This is definitely not one. Uh, it's got some kind of a, an actual pattern in it and the greenish color. So none of these really match any of the, the ones that I've been showing. So I search for fossilized. And again, you can see Frank didn't have to look very far to find the image he sent. Um, and again, we're just looking at the same things. This is the only one I saw that really 
looked a bit like a, a fossilized heart. And again, without being able to see the backside, it's hard to know. But you've got the the iron and what potentially could be the, the interventricular septum. So this is the website that Frank got the image from. And it's ironic because if you scroll down, that's the backside. Could could very well be a heart, and we'll look at this upright in a, in just a moment. Um, but it's interesting that uh, the only comment on the on the page is that, however, soft tissue fossils are very rare and typically do not show up as casts. They are trace fossils, usually visible only as a shadow in UV light and in the encasing rock. Please don't be discouraged. It's a very good mineral sample, but I don't believe it to be a fossil. So this guy sounds like he might know what he's talking about, and he doesn't think it's a heart stone. I do. Um, if we look at this here, this is what Frank is on about. Uh, he's talking about the interventricular septum, keeps calling it the intravascular septum. The f this portion here is broken away, as is all of this. So you can imagine if that was still there that this would very likely look like one of many heart stones that I've shown in my videos. Um, but he wants us to think that this is a physical structure that exists in the middle of the heart and that is just not the case. And I'll go more into that in just a moment. Um, so he sent three images. This is another that he sent. And I'm fine with this being a heart. You, you can see the remains of the, the blood vessel openings up here, the aorta, the vena cava. No real hint of an interventricular septum except a little bit of a crease. And without cutting it open, you can't know for sure. Um, but I've had uh, many hearts that, uh, that have not looked like this, but have little lines or creases and not this big... Uh, big thick crystallized line that, that uh, Frank is showing. He sent this as well. He's claiming this is a dinosaur heart. I've found no hearts that look anything like this. This is an unusual uh, example, if, if it is. And this interventricular septum, again, is what he's pointing out. So then I did a search for dinosaur heart, right? Because I wanted to see... Oh, look. There it is, <laughs> second one. So Frank did some really in-depth research here. Um, yeah, dinosaur heart, question mark. And I scroll down and there's really no other examples. So you don't find fossilized hearts, you don't find fossil hearts, you don't find even dinosaur hearts. Um, and we'll come back to Michael Tellinger in just a moment. So then I searched on Google because I thought maybe I'd get different results, but it's the same thing. Here comes that one again. Here are some bivalves. And really nothing to go on and nothing that looks like the rocks that I've been uh, making videos about either. So this is definitely a pattern that hasn't been recognized in geology. And then I searched for petrified heart and more of these uh, polished things. This is a bivalve, as is that. Um, this is the only one that looked anything like the the heart stones that I've done done videos on. This could very well be a heart valve, and this could just be mud that's caked onto the end. So I'm not sure about that one. I'd need a closer look before I'd make up my mind about it. But even petrified heart uh, doesn't really yield much in the way of examples that we can look at that would... Uh, tell us anything except for the one that Frank uh, clipped out. So then I found this on eBay. This looks like one of mine and uh, now you can maybe understand why they think I'm probably in this for the money. If I can get these authenticated in their hearts I can start to sell them for three thousand dollars a pop or something. Uh, but this definitely appears to have the interventricular septum as you can see. It's got the the classic shape. So um, I don't know what he would say about this one. Maybe he would think it was uh, worthy of uh, spectroscopy. I don't know. So I just wanted to say a couple things about Michael Tellinger. This is uh, one example of a heart stone. Here he is holding the same rock. Uh, we don't get to see the backside of it, unfortunately. Um, and this is another one that he's got in his collection that's absolutely beautiful. He's 
uh, started a mud fossil museum in South Africa. I have great respect for Michael Tellinger. I think he's done fantastic work. He's covered a, a very wide variety of different topics over the years and uh, is extremely well-spoken and seems to be a generally uh, good person. Um, and yeah, here he is showing, he's got a, a museum in South Africa that uh, I think is just being run on donations. So feel free to send him some. He's written many books and uh, he's also f um, founded uh, the Ubuntu party of uh, South Africa, which is a political party that's based on the principles of Ubuntu contributionism. And, uh, oh, look, he's a promoter of pseudo-archaeology. Hmm. So is he a crackpot or somebody that's trying to uh, share information that goes against mainstream narratives? He's also got a project called One Small Town. It's a very novel idea about how small towns and communities can run their economies in a way that can actually eventually free them up from the need for money and it's all based on the principle of contributionism so that is also a very interesting uh, topic Michael Tellinger cool guy and has he seen any of my videos or, or yeah 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 I sent him the link he, he checked out a couple of them he goes yeah that's some interesting stuff there you know yeah so um <laughs> And, and and there's and there's nothing else like it, you know. I mean, there's no nobody else has got a uh, got, and that's what, really what I like. I like people that are doing original material that nobody else on YouTube is doing, and that's what I try to do with my videos. Remember, it was Harry who initially reached out to me, not the other way around. In my conversations with both of them, I made it clear that what I was most interested in obtaining was a breakdown of the elemental composition of the stones by percentage something that spectroscopy is uniquely suited to show. I, I mean, what kind, of, what kind of testing are you, are you considering getting? What, what do you think? Uh, it would, you would have um, available. Uh, mineral composite, uh, um, any crystallization, any uh, uh, microscopic uh, details, uh, hardness. Uh, when you say mineral composition, are you referring to spectroscopy, like an XRF machine? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. He's got everything. Okay. He's got everything. So um, if he's got an XRF machine, that's what I've really most been wanting to do with these. As I understand it, they hit it with some kind of radiation, and then it reflects back, and that tells them what, what the different uh, constituent elements are and what percentages are there. Okay. Which is, which is the most interesting of all, because then you can compare that to, well, what do we know about the, the, you know, the heart and what its, compose, its com composite elements are okay. in, a heart, you know, in, a, in a fleshy heart. Honestly, I'm quite surprised that Frank's vast pathology and anatomy experience never came up in our telephone conversation. And when I asked if he'd seen any of my videos, he said he had not. And then he stressed the importance that he places upon remaining impartial when analyzing specimens. When discussing spectroscopy with Frank and Harry, there was no indication from either of them that such an analysis might be cost prohibitive, or that the stones would first have to pass Frank Aon's anatomical analysis to be deemed worthy of a more in-depth investigation. In fact, in my conversation with Frank, he made it clear that he had access to anything he needs. He even boasted about being granted free use of Chinese particle accelerators for analyses on particularly challenging specimens. As a world-renowned expert in jade antiquities, he's developed a close relationship with the Chinese government, and they've gifted him the use of the machines that would normally cost two to three thousand dollars a minute and must be rented for a minimum of a half day. That's roughly half a million dollars for a half day of testing. You can hear him discuss this in his own words in the Explorers Club lecture at the one hour, three minute mark. Okay, well listen, I appreciate your, uh, your, your time on it and, um, and I'll get with him and uh, I'll put this in the cloud so he can listen to it. Okay. And, and, then, uh, uh, and then he can call me and, and, uh, and we'll see which way he wants to take it. 
And uh, um, but uh, but I but I that, that's pretty doggone brave of him, and uh, and I appreciate that. I appreciate him a lot. So. Listen, Harry, you're one of my favorite people, and I'm glad you're my friend. <laughs> hey, hey, same here, man. <laughs> uh, we 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 we've seen a whole lot of stuff <laughs> coming and going. So. <laughs> yes, yes, we have, and we've known quite a few characters, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so. So, and I hope that continues for another couple of decades. So. I hope so too. All right. Well, listen. Peace out, brother. And uh, um, and and um, I'll do some head scratching on this and see about getting it up in uh, whatever. So. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Now. Bye. And then on the twenty-first of July, I received his formal report. To those this may concern, from the 4th of July until the 15th, Orenda Lab examined seven of a group of unknown rocks shipped from Spain. Microscopy on three microscopes, including a stereoscopic binocular, industrial grade microscope, and two loops were used to examine the rocks and in particular the broken samples to see inside of the rocks. Then, chemical analysis was executed, first using solvents and various molarities of acids and bases to verify elemental composition. Because the chemical testing was extension, and no additional monies were forthcoming, spectrometry analysis was not executed. The lab has very similar types of calcitic polysilicates in the form of almost identical cobbles as known samples in the lab material database. Ferric oxide inclusions were indicated, meaning it contained iron. Predictable minerals were also indicated, silica, alumina, and magnesia in condensed clay forms. Solvents that were applied were xylene, acetone, benzene, and methylene chloride were applied to the stone and sizings. Glues, modern coatings, or sealants of any type were not indicated. The unknown samples were compared to conglomerate cobbles and fossilized hearts, and the unknown cobbles did not in any way match or bear any resemblance to fossilized hearts. After receiving Frank Aon's official report and agonizing over the large amount of work that would be required to mount a thorough rebuttal, out of the blue, I received a serendipitous email from a medical doctor. This was just another of many wonderful synchronicities surrounding my investigations into these topics. He wrote, Hi, buddy. Stumbled across your amazing videos. Thank you for what you do, and please don't ever let anyone shut you down from speaking your truth. I'm a medical doctor with several years of surgical experience, including lecturing in anatomy at university for several years. I have experience assisting open-heart surgery, and with that background, I couldn't help but take interest in your heart video. From your videos, I can see that you've taken the time to hone your anatomical knowledge. Good on you. I can see details in your videos relating to bones that perhaps few would even realize. It's fascinating to watch, and the heart images are intriguing. I've only fully watched two of your videos, so I must take the time to watch the rest. The details in the stones are repetitive, and the same anatomical correlations keep popping up again and again, and I would suggest that by picking up random rocks, that would have to be statistically impossible. I couldn't help but reach out and say hi and make contact. Not many people tend to think outside the box and fewer have the fine observational skills to notice that many of the stones you discuss do not seem to fit the usual explanation of how they formed. One thing I always keep an open mind on is the version of history we've all been told may not be as accurate as we would all like to think. If my knowledge or experience can in any way help, I humbly offer it. I have some experience in archaeology, and my background in anatomy and medicine matches nicely with your topic. I watched another heart video of yours this morning. The detail to my eye was all but undeniable. I fail to see how rocks can randomly form with the features you point out again and again. In the video where you broke open a few, 
The correlating features continue on the inside also, which surely has to be impossible for a random rock. If you can involve some like-minded people that are not afraid to question the narrative, then I'm sure you could learn more about the stones and paint a clearer picture. I'm sure you understand that most, 99.99%, will just laugh it off as your suggestions are silly and simply miss the point altogether. P.S. In summary, I think from what you've told me, perhaps you are meeting some healthy criticism, and I can't help but feel that they've not taken your points seriously. Again, I state the question, is it possible for the same features to turn up again and again? I can't bring myself to believe such exquisite detail can keep repeating itself in an environment that is supposed to be completely random. I'd like to think that any person or scientist could at least stop for a moment and consider the possibility that maybe, just maybe, you might be right. I'm not convinced you've had a fair review of your work done with an open mind. I got the impression that those critiquing your work do not see anything of interest and went about saying as much as best they could. That's okay. People can and will make up their own mind on the information presented to them. And if they think that there's nothing in your rocks, then by all means, let them subscribe to another channel. Those who can see what you're trying to say will listen attentively, in my opinion, and that's their reward for having an open mind to at least consider that you may have stumbled across something very fascinating. It pains me to say this, but in the current world climate, those who refuse to open their minds and see the truth are going to find it harder and harder to make sense of the world. Those like yourself who are prepared to consider the impossible or think outside the box and challenge what they were once taught are going to lead the way. I can promise you that, my friend. So whether you're right or wrong is irrelevant. I say bravo for asking the question in the first place. For what it's worth, I think you may have made an amazing discovery. But of course, you need to get some more information and helpers to research it to the point of zero doubt, if possible. Keep up your great work. And then after having a chance to briefly review some of the images from the CAT scan I sent him, he had this to say. Got the CT on my work computer, but only the still images. First image appears to nicely show the septum. Need to study it more. So how's that for an interesting contrast to Frank Aon's authoritative opinions? Obviously, this medical doctor's emails came as a welcome and rather unexpected second opinion. Sadly, due to the outright tyranny some governments are perpetrating upon its people, particularly its medical professionals who speak against the narrative, this doctor prefers to remain anonymous for the time being. But we have spoken on the phone a few times, and he's offered his expertise to help in analyzing the CAT scans I had performed at the end of August. We hope to record an audio conversation in the not-too-distant future discussing the results. And then this morning, uh, just as a wonderful addition to that letter, I received a comment on the YouTube channel, and uh, it was, let's see, here it is. He writes, This all fascinates me. I'm a veterinarian with a master's in science. You take me right back to the anatomy lab and the plastinated organs. What I keep saying to myself is, this all looks more statistically significant than rocks being smoothed over in the exact same way by water or erosion. Hmm. In January last year, I received an email from a PhD in chemistry, and he wrote, uh, I saw your video because of SGT report. I watched that interview and then binge watched the whole series. I've hated biology since freshman year, but this was fascinating. I'm open-minded and willing to explore. You've obviously discovered something awesome. I can't wait till they start to ridicule it. And finally, accept it as obvious. Should be fun. Keep up the good work. And the unknown cobbles did not, in any way, match or bear any resemblance to fossilized hearts. They did, however, match calcitic polysilicate conglomerate cobbles. So he compared them to other cobblestones, then claimed they bear no resemblance to hearts. His statement is patently false, as is clearly shown in each of my videos on the subject and throughout this video as well. Mohs hardness tests were also executed, and the hardness ranged about five and a half. As an added note, for those curious about my background, 
I was a pathologist's assistant and histologist. I did autopsies and processed tissues for those autopsies and surgeries, preparing slides for the pathologist for diagnosis. I worked at three hospitals and under as many pathologists. I then went back to school and acquired master's degrees in geology, mineralogy, metallurgy, and inorganic chemistry. I have been president and operated Orenda Labs since 1975. I would encourage the sender of these cobbles to verify my findings with any other legitimate and credentialed lab anywhere in the world for comparison and contrast of information and indications. The cobbles are not fossilized hearts, period. Frank Aon. And then he adds, The three images included are of two paleomammalian fossilized hearts and one fossilized dinosaur heart. Please note the red arrows which point at and indicate the intervascular septum. None of the cobbles examined had any indications or traces of this iconic anatomical part of the heart. I know, I know, and, and, and I knew, I knew, we, we knew going into it. So after reading Frank's full letter, I clicked on the attached PDF file and was initially excited because I thought, okay, finally, we're going to see a little bit of laboratory analysis here. And uh, I'll leave it to the uh, the more suspicious of the, the listeners to decode the logo and address of, of this uh, organization. But anyway, uh, it goes like this, to whom it may concern, and it's got a photograph of one of the, the rocks that I sent him. The image above is of a cobble sent to Arenda Lab from Spain. As an experiment, 100 people were asked what it looked like. They were asked before any information was offered about it. The question asked was, what does this rock look like? Or, what does it remind you of? The following are the results. 15 said it looked like a skull. 35 said it looks like a rock. 3 said it looks like a cloud. 8 said it looks like a smiling turtle head. Now that was the moment at which I paused and I thought, this is a little suspicious. That's an extremely specific answer. And 8 people are going to say that it looks like a smiling turtle head? Ah. Uh, I'm a little doubtful. Twelve said it looked like a ghost. Okay, yeah, ghost, I can sort of I can sort of buy that. But seven said it reminds me of a sad puppy's face, also very specific. So now it's looking more to me like a hundred people weren't asked, but somebody just randomly came up with a bunch of answers and spread them across some different descriptions and yeah. Five said it looked like a swan. Three said it looked like a white monkey's head. And 12 said it looks like a heart. So my guess is 100 people were not asked. And the fact that he had the, the gall 
to call this an experiment is just astonishing. Uh, yeah. Those that said it looked like a heart were then asked if it looked like a heart or just like the heart symbol. Ten said the heart symbol. So it doesn't even look like a physical heart in, in their minds. And then this next long paragraph is basically all summarized by one word. He's saying that this is pareidolia. Indigenous peoples often rely on the doctrine of signatures, symbols, to find useful items for ceremony, for healing, for practical purposes. If it looks like a heart, then it is good for the heart. An area found filled with cobbles that look like hearts would become a sacred place, where they were, whether they were desiccated hearts, fossilized hearts, or simply cobbles that reminded one of hearts. Such is the human experience. It should not be confused with science, nor should pseudoscience be employed for truthful explanations. He should follow his own advice there, in my opinion, having the nerve to call this an experiment. All human experience should be honored and a reasonable acceptance should follow. Even so, people should be able to discern reasonable and scientific explanations from all others. Frank Aon of Arenda Lab. Survey says... So then I started to wonder, what should I have expected from a laboratory report? Uh, so I scrolled down and clicked on the first few links and um, saw this example of a well-written lab report. It has an abstract, an introduction, materials and methods, and, uh, and then eventually you got some results, a discussion of the results, you have references, and then numbers. And this is exactly what uh, I would learn to do in school when I did my master's thesis in chiropractic. Um, we had our methods and our results and our models and all of these things. Here's another example. Abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion. And um, yeah, then you have your references and here come the numbers and tables and charts and whatnot. And here's a third one, objective, method, Data, data and error analysis. Some tips on writing a good report. Objective method and raw data. This is a physics lab report, so it would be different, obviously. But there's your data analysis, and um, yeah, this is kind of what I was anticipating. On September 1st, 2021, I sent a reply to Harry and Frank. Dear Harry and Frank, I'd like to express my gratitude to both of you for taking your time and for taking an interest in the research I've presented. I've had a bit of vacation time, so please excuse my slow response. Now that I've had the opportunity to review the texts and photos you provided, I must admit I'm rather puzzled. While I did receive a letter from Frank summarizing the tests he performed and offering his opinions about the stones, I've not yet been provided with any laboratory test results. From our first correspondence, attached, Harry offered to provide a thorough forensic analysis with documentation. He also stated that, of course, you would receive a bound report. In separate telephone conversations with each of you, I expressed my primary goal in sending the stones was to obtain an accurate breakdown of the elemental composition by percentage. In both calls, we discussed the use of spectrometry and I was led to believe this analysis would be performed. Based on those conversations and further correspondence, I had anticipated a numerical statistical breakdown of the constituent elements comprising the stones. I'm well aware that this work was being done on a voluntary basis as a favor to Harry. Nevertheless, I'd like to emphasize that there was no mention that spectrometry was cost prohibitive or that it would not be done due to the fact that no additional monies were forthcoming. I sent the stones in good faith, seeking no compensation other than the promised lab report, and I'm still awaiting a breakdown of the data that a thorough forensic analysis would yield. Kindest regards, Mike Wilkerson. Frank Aon replied the same day. To Mr. Mike Wilkerson, Harry requested the analytical examinations and tests. 
the report requested with X-ray fluorescent spectrometry is $3,000 protocol. Harry did not mention a printed report. I find it odd you expect monies for Orenda doing analytical tests. I did the work for Harry. Please sort any confusion out with him. The emails and verbal reports were what I was asked to do. I did not receive a single penny for the effort, nor for the emails and verbal recordings. Not one penny. You were not the first to expect great effort for nothing except an unfortunate malady of entitlement. Several colleagues have shown me several sites of your ventures. My only response is that I encounter pseudoscience offerings every day. If you have any further questions or communications, please do them with Harry. Sincerely, Frank Aon of Arenda Lab. I don't know. What do you think? Maybe my expectations were too high. Am I really suffering from what Aeon called an unfortunate malady of entitlement? Well, whether that's true or not, for Frank to claim that the stones I sent him exhibited none of the key anatomical features of hearts is categorically false. Take a look at this one I sent him. It's a beautiful example of what I've already spent multiple videos describing. This has nine of the most common features from the heartstone evaluation list that I presented in my videos. They are the classic harp shape, a tapering in of the descending sides, a flattened top with both the aorta and vena cava openings, a flattened and slightly inward curved backside, a suture line, a white exterior, which is the pericardium, with a red fleshy interior, which can be seen in the blood vessel openings and through the portions of the outer rock that have eroded. So let's dig into the magical intervascular, I mean ventricular septum. I've made a few videos touching on this subject and shared the work of the Spanish cardiologist Francisco Torrent Guasp, whose discoveries revolutionized our understanding of the structure and the function of the heart. His discoveries also thoroughly debunked the centuries-old model of the heart as a pump. Sadly, most medical doctors today, and even a majority of cardiologists, are unaware of his discoveries or their monumental implications on health and the natural sciences. If you look at this picture that Aeon sent, it might seem as if the septum is a physical structure in the middle of the heart. While this is true in a sense, what it really is, is a meeting point of different portions of the heart muscle fibers. This can easily be understood when the heart is unraveled. Yes, you heard that right. Unraveled. When correctly prepared and unraveled, the heart is immediately understood to be a continuous set of fibers that twist during embryonic development into a knot that forms the complex structure that we call the heart. Frank Aon, with his extensive experience slicing open hearts, may be unaware of this. If so, he's not alone, as most cardiologists today know nothing of Guasp's monumental discoveries. And still, to this day, in lower and higher educational curriculums, this knowledge is either non-existent or, at best, poorly integrated. None of us has been taught the true structure or function of the heart in school. Not chiropractors, not even cardiologists. Instead, we continue to be fed the classic four-chamber pump model, which has never sufficed, and was long ago debunked for a variety of reasons I won't go into here. But if you're curious about the subject, I highly recommend the documentary about Gossip's life called The Helical Heart. Oh, and be sure to see my video on the topic called Helical Hearts, Petrified Organs and Synchronicities, where I showcase Gossip's discoveries and the way in which they tie in to the work of the great Austrian scientist Victor Schauberger. Gossip's discovery also led me to recognize something I hadn't seen in the stones, which I share in that video as well. It's a fantastic story, and it'll change the way you think about both the heart and geology, and perhaps even life. Guasp died in 2005, but I was fortunate to have the pleasure of meeting his son, who bears the same name, and I tell that story in my video entitled, Son of a Titan. Anyway, after over a decade of dissections trying to understand the true structure and function of the heart, Guasp finally hit upon a novel method of dissection that could be done gently and almost entirely without the need for cutting tools. 
By first boiling the heart and carefully removing the outer fatty portions, he revealed the sulcus lines, or the meeting points of the muscle fibers, which could then be bluntly separated by using just the pads of his fingers. In other words, centuries of anatomists have gotten it wrong, and slicing hearts open does not reveal their true structure. Sorry, Frank. Okay, so back to the interventricular septum. Just going to show you some heart pictures to drive home a few of the points uh, as far as the anatomy goes, since that seems to be such an important aspect of uh, Frank Aon's analysis. So here the ventricular septum looks fairly thin, but it can also look very thick depending on where you do the slicing. From the outside, if the fat is removed or there isn't much, it just looks like a little thin line like you see here. But the fat tends to grow where the blood vessels are, and sometimes it can be very thick as you can see in this picture. This is, oh, this is a, an elephant heart, and they're very large as you can see, and kind of shaped like a blob, whereas a giraffe heart is long and narrow, kind of like the animal. <laughs> this is the pericardium, the thick fatty outer sac, and this is one of the thickest that I've ever seen. And fat can form on the outside as well. And the blood vessels <clears throat> are very malleable, and any kind of pressure is going to uh, close those off, and then you get a crease or an indentation or just a, a discoloration. You can see how thin the blood vessels are here. And note these lines, this curve here and this curve here. And you can see they grow like rivers. They're absolutely gorgeous. And here again, we've got these curves. So here they're going, it's almost like an M shape. And then here, this is the picture from Guasp's dissection. You can see the, the curved lines here. This is the backside of the heart. And I put this picture in just to show this whole area is gone. This is like burned away. These thin floppy things are not what's left. What's left is the, the bulk of the heart. And you can see once the fat is completely removed, you can hardly even see the septum. It's just the meeting point of these different fibers can see it better in that picture. And here he's <clears throat> starting to dissect it. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just where this meets that. And once you open it up, there's no septum there. It depends on how you slice the heart. So this is a cross section of, uh, I'm not sure if it's an artery or a, or a capillary. I don't know what the diameter is. It, you can't really see it here. Um, but I just wanted to show this because I've seen these in the rock. So um, you, you can see crystallization that's going horizontally and vertically in different directions. And it's usually like a fractal pattern in the hearts. But when you look at them under a microscope, you see little crystalline rings. And I'll show, I'll show some pictures of those. So that's consistent with my theory about what I would expect to find. The outer portions of the hearts have a very crystalline, fatty kind of a feel to them when you're looking at them. Um, and, and then you can see, you know, the iron rich inner portions of the stones. Um, in the video, Broken Hearts Tell Tales, I break open a number of them. Here you can see the, the, uh, the fractal nature of the blood vessels very clearly. This is what the blood vessels look like, how they're distributed. There you get a better idea of it. Explains the patterns on the rocks pretty well. And here sometimes you, you just get the faint lines of, of what is, you know, the suture lines or the septum. This is the back, and here's that curve, and you can see it right there as well. There's a clear septum, 
and this is this has also got that faint line going right down and you see the tapering in here and here take a look at this picture <laughs> same shape isn't it in fact his fingers might actually be on what was once a, a septum same same but different so this uh, picture is something I wanted to go back to as well, because Frank is talking about the cobbles having concentric rings in them, and that they look like clay. And these these are not hard stones. The, these ones with the lines here, these could be chunks of petrified wood. They could be, um, you know, per perhaps even sedimentary layers. There might be some truth to the whole cobblestones coming from compressed clay thing, but I'm rejecting it when it comes to the heart stones because uh, first of all, there's none of this ringing or layering that you see in, in most of these rocks. The only rock here that looks like, actually there are a couple, there's this one here, you can see it's got the tapering in and that little discoloration at the top where an aorta would have been. So that one uh, matches the, the pattern. This one potentially as well. I'd want to see it from, from another side. This could be the, the top, could be down below. Um, but the rest, uh, this is not what I would normally find. So I went looking for some other pictures of these kinds of rocks and actually um, couldn't find much. And until last night, I was watching a video of John Levy's and he, um, he showed this. <laughs> So the vast majority of these are not hard stones. They've all got these concentric circles and lines. I think they're part of uh, former trees or something. But there are a few in there that I would, I would uh, want to take a closer look at. But most of these look to me to be chunks of um, larger structures, as opposed to the hard stones, which are continuous. They're unbroken, and as soon as there's a fracture or a crack in them at all, it's it's very easily seen, whereas the vast majority of these are, are broken pieces. Oh, there's one right there, upside down. Shout out to John Levy. You do amazing work. I always look forward to your videos. Um, Paul Cook is doing some amazing boots on the ground research right now. I can warmly recommend his channel as well. John Levy and Paul Cook. Harry's response came the following day. It's a scathing and long response. Uh, the areas in red are sections from my original letter to him, which I'll read just so that you have context for his replies. Dear Harry and Frank, now that I've had the opportunity to review the texts and photos you provided, I must admit that I'm rather puzzled. What? You're puzzled? I'm the one that's puzzled. Why didn't you bother to take your heart-shaped stones to any geologist, mineralogist, or paleontologist and have them examined? You could have most easily approached any museum near you that displays dinosaurs or any nearby university lab and expect an initial analysis at no cost. Did you ever cut one in half? Did you ever bust any with a hammer? If you had, you would have readily noticed that these specimens are not what you claim them to be. Final point. Hence, there was no need whatsoever to escalate the issue with more documented proof that there were some kind of a petrified heart. Had there been reason for such, I would have asked Frank for more documentation, and I would have initiated a Phase 1 examination, which would have cost me $250. It would have been bound, mind you, and if you were willing to go further, that would have been on your dime, as you can spend lots of money on such. The end result being that whatever the sample or artifact, it is worth a lot more money when it has been tested and documented. To supply you with any additional documents would have been ludicrous. However, we are convinced that you will not see it that way and will moan and groan until you get another opinion from a professional geologist or paleontologist. These heart-shaped stones have been your backbone for years, and we realized you would not go down easily because of your pride how much the heart-shaped stones have meant to you, and of course, the dozens of YouTube flicks you've made concerning them. The next section I wrote was, while I did receive a letter from Frank summarizing the tests he performed and offering his opinions about the stones, I've not yet been provided with any laboratory test results. He replies, 
That's what the email and dialogue were all about. Your samples were of no interest, value, or particular peculiarity, other than that they are shaped like hearts. And, and uh, uh, yeah, he, he, he was excited. It, it's, 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 not, it, it's unusual to hear Frank get excited about anything. <laughs> so, but when he does, he does, you know, so. It, it. Has he seen any of my videos, or, or do you yeah, yeah, yeah? I sent him the link. He, he checked out a couple of them. He goes, yeah, that's some interesting st stuff there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, cool. and 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 there's and there's nothing else like it, you know. I mean, there's no nobody else has got a uh, got, and that's what, really what I like. I like people that are doing original material that nobody else on YouTube is doing, and that's what I try to do with my videos. I write from our first correspondence attached. Harry offered to provide a thorough forensic analysis with documentation. He also stated that, of course, you would receive a bound report. He says, I have. Just print up Frank's emails to you, along with this one as well as all of my emails, being sure to include accurate transcripts of all of our phone calls. Put them in a jacket, and there you have all the documentation to be fully aware that you are currently selling a con game. Frank dances around that, but I'm sure he'll appreciate my blunt and honest candor. Then I say, in separate telephone conversations with each of you, I expressed my primary goal in sending the stones was to obtain an accurate breakdown of the elemental composition by percentage. He says, that is clearly stated verbally in email. He gives you the composition, and who cares how much ratio to calcite some river rock is? I suppose you are hoping somehow the pain will go away by pitching the ball back on us as to why this and why that. But the answer is quite clear. We can slap you with facts all day long, and suppose if you did actually at one time go to a geologist, he told you the same thing. Then I write, In both calls we discussed the use of spectrometry, and I was led to believe that this analysis would be performed. He says, I didn't. You did. I don't know much about it. I explained, to learn about what would be done and how the analysis would go, that you'd have to speak to Frank. But I remember clearly that Frank explained to you as well, as I, that these pieces did not require to be tested using spectrometry. They didn't need it. Bear in mind, that was weeks before he received them. I'd suppose if you took these heart-shaped stones to some lab for spectrometry analysis, they would laugh you out of the parking lot. Did you ever scrape one under a toilet lid? That test is quite helpful, fast and easy. UV lamp experiments are also useful and common. You could have done a lot more to save face with all the pomp and circumstance you've basked in over the past few years. Then I write, Based on those conversations and further correspondence, I'd anticipated a numerical, statistical breakdown of the constituent elements comprising the stones. He says, okay, that's an easy one for me. Let me have the floor. They are 100% bogus. Had they been of any interest whatsoever, I would have done so. If you wish for me to, I will carefully print up all the documentation, transcribe and print the phone calls, get them all notarized, and boom! You have all your documentation proving your heart-shaped stones are basically worthless specimens with no or little monetary value. Sorry, bud. It happens. More often than you think. I'll explain more at the end of this missive. Then I write, I'm well aware that this work was being done on a voluntary basis as a favor to Harry. Nevertheless, I'd like to emphasize that there was no mention that spectrometry was cost prohibitive or that it would not be done due to the fact that no additional monies were forthcoming. You're living in denial. But you'll get over it eventually. If it took you this long to respond to what had been, according to years of YouTube videos, the most important issue of your life's work, then you must have really pondered over this reply letter you sent us long and despairingly. I've been asked several times in the past weeks if you've responded to us yet. Oh, I'm on vacation, and we'll look at it later. But you emailed me, I think two or three times, asking if I had heard anything from Frank. That's a big duh. And it appears to me that you're now in the longest dry season of posting videos yet on your channel. 
I may be corrected on that issue, but in a humble way, I'm sure. Finally, I said, I sent the stones in good faith, seeking no compensation other than the promised lab report, and I'm still awaiting a breakdown of the data that a thorough forensic analysis would yield. He says, you have your forensic report right there in front of you. Just print it up. I know everything there is to know about your heart-shaped stones, so why don't you? There's no need to sink more time and money into proving whether or not they're petrified hearts or anything beyond river rocks. However, I will pay for shipping or your fuel expenses for you to send some samples to any one of the following institutions to verify or prove otherwise Frank's results. Oxford Geology and Mineralogy Departments. The same departments at the University of France, University of Munich, University of Florence, the University of Geneva, University of Madrid, or more easily, a museum in Madrid. Each of these institutions would easily denounce your claims in support of Mr. Aon's analysis. Why didn't you explore these avenues in the first place? Put me to it. I'll cover for you and pay you accordingly. Choose one on me. The rest are on you. My initial issue was indeed this. I've studied rocks, minerals, fossils, etc. all my life and possess one of the world's best compact mineral collections, for what it is. When I saw your heart-shaped stones, I knew there was no way a heart could ever be petrified without field medium and especially bones. Given also the fact that there could never be any exposed hearts on the surface because scavengers or bacteria would have consumed not just the heart, but all the organs. Where are there any livers, brains, bladders, or kidneys associated with your heart-shaped stones? I knew it was all impossible. Is it time for another vacation? Perhaps. Hey, get back to me in a few months. I'll be here. Thank you graciously for your time and patience to even get through this letter. I hope it finds you well and in good spirit. Best you and yours always, and I've enjoyed working with you on this project. I am Harry Hubbard, the Paradigm Crusher. Another paradigm crushed. Really? My friend Dr. Lenny Time has a PhD in molecular chemistry, and we had some correspondence exchanges about this, and he writes, Hi, Mike. I guess this says it all about motivation. I am Harry Hubbard, the paradigm crusher, another paradigm crushed. He says, Science is broken because academics have been dishonest with their information. Nobody can be correct in the current paradigm because the facts shift to meet the theories. If they are inconvenient, then they can cancel them. Look how many bones the Smithsonian Museum had ordered destroyed to build the current narrative. If you're a scientist and you're going to do a chemical analysis, it has to be based upon the data. Where's the data? There's no data there. It's all speculation. A chemical analysis is the collection of data. Pure speculation from within the mainstream geological narrative by somebody who is vested in the narrative. Lenny also has a blog on Minds.com where he shares his thoughts. And he also wrote this, The Paradigm Buster did a hit and run act on my friend. The insight is that most normies accept the word of mouth from a self-anointed expert who doesn't feel it's necessary to do the lab work to confirm his opinion because, well, he knows what things should look like. Now, I don't know what you think at this point. I concede I, I could have worded my letter to Frank and Harry a little more diplomatically, but I think it's fair to say that I was anything but rude. But based on their immediate responses, they were both clearly triggered, and in the blink of an eye, they flipped from helpful and friendly to venomous, arrogant, and accusatory. Harry and Frank commended me for my bravery in not only putting myself out there to share these findings, but for also having the guts to follow up and subject the stones to rigorous testing. And yet, as soon as I requested some actual data to review, they turned immediately vicious. Why? Maybe because they see me as a deluded science-denying snake oil salesman. How dare I question Frank Aon's impeccable authority, or dare to request the information that they initially reached out and offered to provide? 
just shut up, kid, and accept the truth, because smarter people than you figured this out long ago. Some have asked me why I haven't pursued the academic route with this research. The answer is because, if I'm right, it's highly unlikely that the gatekeepers of geology would let something like this through. And I don't know about you, but I'd say that this experience has been a perfect example of how that would go. So no, I'm not about to devote years of my life to chasing academic recognition when I'm already acutely aware of deeply rooted corruption at the highest levels in academia. This is why I decided from the beginning that I'd approach this as an open source investigation. By sharing this research openly, the ideas have already been seen by thousands of eyes, and hopefully some of those people will begin to investigate for themselves and contribute to an undeniably growing body of evidence. The more who do, the less likely this information will ever be buried by people with vested interests in the current paradigm. Both Frank and Harry have insinuated in different ways that I'm in this for the money. This is absolutely absurd. The fact is, if I had spent half the time I spent over the last three years focusing my energy on my chiropractic practice rather than this crazy research, I would surely have doubled my income. I took to YouTube wanting to make sure this information gets out there, free for all, with no risk of being buried by peer-reviewing gatekeepers. The simple fact is that I've spent more of my own money on this endeavor than I have earned through YouTube revenue or donations. To this date, I have sold nothing, and other than a couple of links to PayPal and Bitcoin in the liner notes of my videos, I have never once asked for donations. This is the lifetime revenue. It's been a total of $716 since the beginning. I put out six or eight videos before I monetized the channel, and the only reason I did it was because YouTube was going to be changing their terms and conditions and uh, favoring the content that was bringing them in revenue. So there were a lot of different truther channels that thought they were going to use this as an excuse to eliminate channels that were deemed unprofitable. So I decided to monetize it. And I've always chosen the absolute minimum when it comes to ads, that you can click them away. They're only at the very beginning of the video. So, yeah. And then as far as expenses go, I spent 400 euros on a CAT scan for four of the stones. I purchased a couple of microscopes for about 70 euros. Um, gas money. I had to purchase a more expensive telephone so that I could uh, have some better uh, camera capabilities for footage. I've purchased three or four different pieces of software for the editing and audio and whatnot, uh, a microphone as well. So I've definitely spent more than I've earned from this, so the whole snake oil salesman criticism doesn't really fit. I think it's between somewhere between six and seven hundred euros in donations, and the vast majority of that has come from one person. Thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, so it hasn't been a very lucrative adventure. <laughs> Not that that was the intention, but um, to suggest that I've been in this for a profit is uh, far from the truth. So I'd just like to go off topic for a moment and talk a little bit about the Explorers Club. I tend to be a bit suspicious by nature, so when Frank Aon gave his speech at the club, I naturally looked into it because I was curious what it was about. I'd never heard of the Explorers Club. What I found was rather interesting. It's a, uh, a club that is an American-based, international, multidisciplinary, professional society with the goal of promoting scientific exploration and field study. The club was founded in New York City in 1904 and has served as a meeting point for explorers and scientists worldwide. Okay, well that's all well and good. I'm an adventurer myself and I, I like the idea of exploration. Um, the club promotes scientific exploration of land, sea, air, and space by supporting research and education in the physical, natural, and biological sciences. And uh, the members have been responsible for an illustrious series of famous firsts. First to the North Pole, first to the South Pole, first to the summit of Mount Everest, first to the deepest point in the ocean, first to the surface of the moon, all accomplished by the members of the Explorers Club. And um, here you see the picture of their entrance, which I think we have here from the front. 
and this is looking at it from the side. Those two pillars might uh, mean something in a moment. And so I, I just like to say, you know, looking at this place years ago, I would have been thrilled to set foot in here and to just experience a place filled with such a rich history and so many interesting people having gone through there. And sadly, my opinions have, have changed over the last decade, especially over the last five years, and um, we'll, we'll get more onto that in a moment. But it, it's a pretty cool looking place, lots of old furniture and um, yeah. And an illustrious membership. So the club has approximately 3,500 members representing every continent in more than 60 countries. Uh, members include leaders in polar exploration, diving, aerospace exploration, archaeology, zoology, physics, oceanography, astronomy, ecology, geology. Lots of ologies, right? And uh, the world's greatest explorers meet there. So we already talked about the famous firsts, North-South Pole, highest point, deepest part uh, in the Mariana Trench, and first to supposedly set foot on the moon. And uh, current president, honorary chair, honorary president, and I'm not a big fan of any of those three people. Elon Musk as well, James Cameron, he was the director of the movie Avatar. And uh, it's quite the old boys club for, for the elite. Uh, actually, Musk is not a member, correction, he was, uh, received an award and gave a speech there. And uh, then there's a number of other honorary members, Teddy Roosevelt, John Glenn, Walter Cronkite, Prince Philip. Uh, most of these guys are Masons, and I have absolutely nothing against Freemasonry. There's about six million Masons worldwide, according to their own numbers, um, and I think the vast majority of those people are, are good people, and um, they're there for the betterment of themselves and society. But I do think that there are some real crooks in that organization, and a lot of them are listed right here, in my opinion. So you can see Buzz Aldrin, Freemason, and uh, flashing the 666 hand sign and the one eye of Horus. John Glenn. You know, this is I, it's kind of bitter for me to talk about this. I've got a bit of a grudge now against NASA. I was a big space fanboy through almost my entire life. Um, loved Star Trek and Star Wars and read loads of things on on. Uh, you know, astrophysics and all, all kinds of information that had to do with space and sci-fi, the future. And um, yeah, I had heard stuff about possible faking of the moon landings, but it never occurred to me that NASA might have been faking everything since. Um, so if you haven't gone down that rabbit hole, it's a deep and wide one. And um, I recommend that you do because it's kind of hard to make sense of what's happening in the world today if you haven't figured out things like that and uh, the Twin Towers. And, you know, these are some key events that um, uh, the fingerprints of funny business are all over them. This guy, Prince Philip the uh, former husband of the queen. He just died recently. Uh, yeah, I've, what can you say about him that he doesn't say himself? In the event that I'm reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus to contribute something to solving overpopulation. What a wonderful guy. He looks like death warmed over. And here he is with the horns. And his deadly virus gaff haunted him. 33 years ago, the queen husband spoke on the topic of reincarnation and what he would come back as if such a thing existed. Um, yeah. L. Ron Hubbard, very prominent member of this organization as well, sci-fi author, uh, founder of, uh, of the Church of Scientology, author of Dianetics, best friends with um, people like Aleister Crowley and uh, Jack Parsons of uh, JPL. You don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. He 
Yeah, so a lot of Freemason astronauts. And um, yeah, I think most of them are faking and lying about just about everything. And uh, it's a sad thing, but um, that's my belief now after looking into this a great deal uh, over the last many years. And there are a ton of other channels that have covered this far better than I ever could, but um, I definitely recommend looking into it if you haven't. Things are not as they seem. Yeah, anyway. So moving on, this is Lan uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and uh, Buzz Aldrin, and I never remember the third guy's name. Um, and I, I think this is supposedly when they landed, but my guess is this picture was taken before um, they ever supposedly went up because uh, Neil Armstrong looks happy here. They look like they're genuinely having a good time and laughing. And uh, yeah, he looks like a man with uh, a lot of hope in his eyes and is excited about what's about to happen. I was a huge fan of, of him when I was a kid. I actually won a writing competition when I was in junior high. Uh, writing about my hero, and I chose him. And this is the three of them returning, and they're at a press conference, uh, returning from the moon, and I watched this whole thing. It's like an hour, an hour and a half long. These guys look like they're at a funeral, um, and um, Neil Armstrong looks like he got duped and uh, is is very unhappy with the way things went. Doesn't look like a man who's celebrating the greatest achievement in the history of mankind, not to me. Yeah, we can watch this a little bit just to get uh, an idea of what uh, George Nury had to say about it. And, and you know this, for years, for years, Neil Armstrong refused to be interviewed. I found that to be one of the strangest things of anything. You would think that the first man on the moon, the national hero that he is, would have talked to everyone about the experience, about the wonder. That it's didn't happen. The role model was Lindbergh, and Lindbergh became a very public person and was very much out there with his political views and all that. You'd think that, that uh, Neil would have at least wanted to be a role model for the next generation. Instead, he became essentially a recluse, a hermit. And on every anniversary, they would wind him up and trot him out in public. The most interesting one was during the Clinton years at the White House on the 25th anniversary. Or do you remember what Armstrong said, the most stunning thing that an astronaut could say, and I think in this milieu get away with it? Give us the quote. Well, he, he said two things. At the start of his speech, he compared himself and the other astronauts to birds, to parrots. And he then made a joke and he said, and parrots don't fly very well. Well, what else do parrots do? They repeat what, what they're they told. told. Wilbur Wright once noted that the only bird that could talk was the parrot. And he didn't fly very well. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are wonder. One who can remove one of truth's protective layers. Yeah, he seems like a very sad man to me, not uh, the person who accomplished the greatest feat of all time. I think his face says everything. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not uh, an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and and that's the way it happened. And, and if it didn't happen, 
it's nice to know why it didn't happen so in the future if we want to keep doing something we need to know why something stopped in the past that we wanted to keep it going uh, money is a good thing So back to these guys, um, yeah, Buzz Aldrin, there's so many clips of him. Um, check out Astronauts Gone Wild if you haven't seen that documentary. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. Uh, my good friend Alex Michael, also known as the Conspiracy Music Guru, has done a wonderful series of toe-tapping, NASA-bashing, catchy-as-heck songs that... Um, that are also loaded with uh, all kinds of visual proofs as well in his videos, so check him out. If you don't know about this, look into it. And him. And why that might be of interest. So, let's talk a little bit about Richard Garriott. This guy here, he is the current president of the Explorers Club. He's the son of an astronaut and um, he was originally a game designer and programmer and is now involved in a number of aspects of computer game development. I played his games in the 80s. He did the Ultima series and uh, I enjoyed them. Um, and I guess that's how he made his money to go on to be a space tourist because he paid $30 million for the privilege of going up into space. Um, yeah, what a waste of money. Anyway, um, this is his father. And he was in space and NASA hoaxery for decades. This is Garriott going down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. So he holds the record, I think, for being the only person alive to have been to the South Pole, the North Pole, to the lowest point on Earth, which is the Mariana Trench, and then also into space. I don't know if he bothered to climb as Everest or not, but uh, he likes to check off the bucket list. <laughs> Well, that was a synchronicity, wasn't it? Because this is him as a young guy with his little snaky pendant, the Ultima Games. This is a more recent photo. Um, this is him in his, in his garb uh, playing one of his characters in one of his video games. And he apparently was the inspiration for uh, the character that is the creator of the Oasis in the movie ready player one so it's this virtual reality that by the year 2045 we'll all be living in if uh the uh the elite get their great reset as they'd like it um where the remainder of humanity is just living in uh trailer stacks trailer parks that are stacked vertically and basically live their lives on video games and um that's their whole existence um so he was the uh the inspiration for the the main character that created the world that everyone's inhabiting, this guy, uh, James Halliday. And um, here he is, supposedly up on the International Space Station, and he is also credited for having created the first movie in space. It's an eight-minute, absolutely horrible little spontaneous film, and he got some... I think Russian uh, astronauts that could hardly speak English to, to play these truly uh, silly, well, they were playing themselves, really, but the, the whole idea is, is really cringy, as my kids would call it. You can check that out for yourself. Apogee of fear. And he, this, is, this is from uh, another little clip that, I, I can't remember where I found it, but uh, long distance mind control. So he is having a telephone conversation with his father. This is his father here from the ISS. And he decides to, to do a magic trick on his dad. 
And uh, it's very interesting that this is called long distance mind control, because that's exactly what it is. So the idea is he basically um, has his dad think of a card. Oh, this is from the, uh, the other eight minute video. I got them in the wrong order. Um, and his dad just has to think of a card off the top of his head. And then he's sent to this YouTube video and the same card comes up. And th again, this is really interesting because this is called scamschool.tv. And basically this is all mind control and uh, it's right there in your face. You know, he's, um, what they've done, you can see there's a little moment in this video where they clip it and the, the portion where they, they uh, read off the card, you can tell that that's been done 52 times. So depending on which card the guy picks, they send him to a video that makes him think that, uh, that that was known long ago, that he would pick this card when, when this video is played. So it's a clever trick, but not so hard to figure out. Ah, <laughs> friend of mine, Victor, sent me this. Uh, this is absolutely hilarious. Two and a half minutes, not appropriate for kids, um, but apparently uh, the makers of South Park were on to um, onto the Explorers Club, if this is supposed to be the Explorers Club. They, uh, you, you just have to see it. I'm not going to go into details here. So take a look at this. This is our friend Richard Garriott, supposedly up on the International Space Station. And what I think is happening here is the thing on our left, which is the hammer, is CGI layering. And there are lots of examples of this being used by NASA. They've been caught with all kinds of CGI layering glitches. And the question is, if they're really up there, why do they have to fake so much stuff? And why is there a glitching that's happening when uh, they're doing these live streams. It's not the whole screen glitching out, it's layers. So like the background remains untouched where the foreground uh, is actually glitching out. So this, this is even more of a smoking gun in my opinion. Watch this. The hammer and the feather. Well, in this case, our feather will be played here by the four of spades. And you may expect everything up here in microgravity to float because most everything does float. However, sometimes something a little different happens. Sometimes you just might find a little pocket of gravity. And there he is with this little snaky necklace floating around. Yeah. Yeah, a little pocket of gravity or gravity. Just uh, just like that up in the space station. Selective gravity. Fun, isn't it? Oh, or is it microgravity? So now we come full circle back to Frank Aon. He is giving a lecture at this club. And um, so if I were to throw him under the bus and be suspicious of his intentions and whether or not he's genuine based on his affiliation with this organization, I would be committing what's known as a guilt by association fallacy. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give Frank the benefit of the doubt, but I'll leave it up to you guys to decide what uh, you think about his authenticity and his integrity and his intentions. Uh, check out his video. I've already shown that a bunch of times. Just a little bit more about him and his uh, esteemed relationship with the Chinese government and he can uh, go anywhere, anytime to continue the research of Neolithic and Archaic Jades in China. So that's quite a carte blanche that he's been given. That and their use of their particle accelerators. So he also has the highest record in selling jade items in the US and I just wanted to say that when it comes to things like artifacts, antiquities, uh, art, um, the appraisal of and authentication of art is a very, very important role in the process of money laundering. And a lot of the elite engage in this activity. I'm not suggesting for a second that that's what Frank Aon is doing. All I'm saying is that if either of us were to have a vested interest in a particular outcome, 
he definitely has a vested interest in the mainstream geological paradigm, being as he's an expert in it who people turn to for authentication of their goods. If I'm right about the stones, I'd just like to give the benefit of the doubt to both Frank and Harry as far as their intentions go. I really don't know. Um, if I'm correct, then it may just be as simple as paradigm blindness and that they can't see the forest for the trees. But if I am right, then my advice to both of them would be to remain teachable and to question our own stories and to say what you want, but don't preach it as fact. The high priests of scientism with their cloaks of credibility and self-serving pseudoscientific policies have an ever-tightening grip on our lives. And in my opinion, the greatest threat to the elite's stranglehold on public perception is an open-source, decentralized approach to research, economics, and governing. This is vital to the future of humanity. So, what do you think? Am I suffering from pareidolia? Or a pear on the dole? Yeah? I don't know. It's hard to say. Someday maybe I'll know whether I am just a king of the land of pareidolia or a paradigm crusher. I am sometimes called the uh, master of intrigue, paradigm smasher, paradigm crusher, you know, and so, uh, other names like that. Uh, but I'm also called a lot of bad names I won't get into. And I guess a lot of that is because of what we do. Uh, we bust a lot of bovine manure. We call people out on their bovine manure. That they, uh, they come up with pseudo stories uh, uh, based on pseudo facts. And therefore they have fake news. And they create people which are pseudo people or fake people. And, and that's what we do. We go after these people and, and we're like, okay, show us what it is. And sometimes we just have to lump them all together and just crush the entire topic matter. And uh, these people use the term I, I created years ago uh, uh, of pseudo facts. And you have to have pseudo facts to support what we call today fake news. So when you take all these pseudo facts and just make it up as you go, well, the sky is the limit. That's right. <laughs> I'm on your side. I'm trying to help you guys out. Educate you a little bit. So thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this. And until next time, peace out, brothers and sisters. Secret Ancient Man. So if you've been following my channel for any length of time, you'll know that I've shared a number of different synchronicities that have occurred in relationship to this research. And if it wasn't for those little universal confirmations that come so frequently, I probably would have given up on this whole subject a long time ago. But uh, I keep getting these little taps on the shoulder. So this was a fun one. The other evening, I was in a church listening to a choir, and I was sitting at one of the pews, and I looked to the right, and I saw a chair. <laughs> And I looked at the rock underneath the chair and I thought, there's just no way that that can be. So uh, when the music stopped, I got up and I took a closer look. And guess what I found? <laughs> the only rock in the entire church. What are the odds? But you think that's crazy? Take a look at this. About a week ago, we were in a restaurant and uh, I swear to you, I had nothing to do with this. And again, what are the odds?
beautiful tree. And what are the odds of that? What are the odds? <laughs> Look at this. I swear I had nothing to do with this at all. Somebody knows how to pick them, don't they? There's a little indentation up there on the top. And then, and then this one as well, which to me is rotated. <laughs> Who'd have thought, huh? Fascinating, is it not? I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've not seen parts one through five already, take the time to do so. I believe you'll find it worth your while. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. And a huge thank you to all of you who've taken the time to post words of encouragement and those few who have donated for the research. It makes it all worthwhile. Until next time, take care. Don't let the BS artists keep you down. And remember, keep your hearts soft. They work better that way. the 
are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. A mirage. 